Okay. Good morning and welcome to the third day of Inmu Civilians Forum. And it is my great pleasure uh, to invite dear colleague and friend Manel, guru on innovation and creativity, to give the first presentation. Welcome. I will take this one. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. But <laughs> I'm not a guru, so <laughs> you know that the expectations are always hard, so don't, don't believe that. But I'm going to, to, to try to share some knowledge and some uh, practices of uh, experiences from my daily practice. That's why I, I was thinking what to, to present here at this forum. And finally, I decided to, to talk about mainly about cross-fertilization and values driving strategies, values-based innovation, but mixing that with my daily practice. That's why, let's go. So, hi, I'm Manel. So, I want to introduce my activity because you will understand after this slide why I introduce my, my, my daily practice. So, on one side, I'm the head of innovation of a research center for biomedical engineering. It's a big research center from the Technical University of Catalonia. Uh, 13 research groups from, from this university uh, joined together in order to develop different solutions to the, to the challenges of, of the sector, of the healthcare sector. And also at the same time, I have a position as a, as a professor at the School of Economics at the, in the University of Barcelona. And I was invited to, to, to some lectures at the Music College of Catalonia uh, two years ago, and they finally uh, created a position for me as a, because they wanted a, 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 a teacher uh, talking and managing the innovation strategy of the, of the Music College. That's what they do. So different things, but always connected by the innovation spirit. Uh, I start with this question because last year I started to ask my students in class this question. In fact, I inquired them about their sources of inspiration and encouraged them to reflect on how they wish to contribute to a brighter future. Uh, I use the, the sustainable development goals. I personally, I do not totally agree with that. We can discuss about that, but I use them uh, in order to open this question to, to my students. And well, the, uh, I, I, I was surprised with the, with the answers, but I wanted to know them because we know that we have uh, mental issues in some of our students, many things change after the COVID. But this question also serves as an invitation to share par part of my professional activities. And my professional activities mainly take place in this city, in Barcelona. I'm, I'm not from Barcelona, I'm from the north of of, of Barcelona from La Costa Brava, that, that place. Uh, but I want to, to, to show you some remarkable achievements, collaborative spirit and transformative ideas that define this vibrant ecosystem in the city. Uh, uh, Barcelona ranks in, in some of the top five or top three positions in the rankings for startups. So usually we stay we occupy the position after Berlin and London, and we are in the last rankings, we are the third one. It's true, we are attracting a lot of uh, venture capital firms. Ten years ago, there only existed three venture capital firms. Nowadays, there are more than 70. And, and well, most of the important businesses from, from Palo Alto, Silicon Valley, are opening headquarters in Barcelona for exploring Europe, Middle East, and North Africa. So it's super interesting, uh, this moment, and many things are happening. Also related to the healthcare sector, uh, we are the sec it is a sector that is attracting most investment at the moment in the city. So some characteristics of this fertile ground for health tech innovation in Barcelona are the strong healthcare ecosystem, the technological infrastructure, the supportive government policies, the startup and investment culture, attracting both local and international talent. So it's true, we cannot pay the, the highest uh, salaries, but we attract people.
people from all around the world that they want to live the experience of, of, of living in Barcelona. So we have many of the most relevant international conferences and events in, in the world, and there's quality of life, yeah. So trying to, to, to introduce a little bit why I'm talking about that, because this is a starting point for this conversation that will move to, to other sectors. So um, at the moment, there are more than 1,350 companies in the health tech sector, 91 research entities, and it represents the 9% of the Catalonia's GDP. And also we see how the, the numbers increase in digital health supplier and also how it represents the 7% of the employed population in Catalonia. And well, what I want to present you in the next slide, it's mainly focused in what we say health, health tech. Health tech for us is med tech and digital health. This is a picture of my university. This is the Technical University of Catalonia. It's one of the 14th campus. This is called the North Campus. It's in the upper uh, diagonal, the upper side of the diagonal. And, and, and at the bottom, there's the logo of my research center, the Research Center for Biomedical Engineering, that is formed by 13 research groups. So these groups are uh, organized in different areas, as you can, as you can see here. Uh, but the relevant point of that is uh, in our research center, we start to develop our own model. And this is what they want to talk about. This model, in this model, spin-off shares space with researchers, professors, and students. So we, de we decided to, to open the offices and to share all the space with spin-offs, researchers, professors, and students all together. We see that as a pilot of what could be the university of the future. So we are negotiating with, with our uh, uh, dean about, about a, a, a expanding the, the model. For our spin-offs, it's important to be able to remain as close as possible to our researchers because they identify new opportunities, they collaborate on new projects, and achieve faster research valorization. Well, these are the phases of, of the IPs behind these research areas. And how is our model? So I'm trying to be uh, very brief explaining that, but the features are that we focus on unmet medical needs that's why I'm the responsible for developing all this innovation strategy. There's a multidisciplinary approach. We try to offer solutions to the several problems from different perspectives and combining and, uh, different technologies. Access to patients and clinical setting. In fact, for example, we, we, create, we are part of a, of a research institute with a hospital, with the biggest pediatric hospital in Spain. And it was the first time that the technological university get into the, into the board of, the, of this hospital, well, of any hospital, but in that case, this pediatric hospital. It's, a, it's, it's good because we have access to talent. It's a good university. We have very good engineers, and we can detect uh, people for the several positions we're looking for in the several, in the different spin-ups that we, we create. And there's a collaborative setting and location. The, milestone, the milestones are the following because we've proven the model for technology transfer and successful spin-off creation. And this research institute that has around, well, now 130, but one year ago, only 100 researchers, we create the 19% of the spin-offs in our university. And also, the 12% of the patents are from our research center. And we only have the 2.3% of the total UPC researchers from the total, uh, uh, total number of, of researchers in the university. Also, there's impact, value, and job opportunities. And for example, in the past seven years, we created 10 spin-offs. And all these spin-offs are alive. And some of them, well, their studies are totally different, but well, people as Afconobel, 
about one of our spin-offs. Other spin-offs have scale up and they are mm, commercializing their products very successfully. Uh, we have different stories. Uh, these are our spin-offs. Uh, the spin-offs that were born from the research center, uh, they, they are focused on, on, on several needs, but offering very interesting solutions that I will expose later, but at the beginning of these technologies. That's, it's our, of, of our ideas. We try to, to introduce through innovation these technologies at the bottom of, of what is called the S-curve, okay? I, I will talk that. Uh, we wanted to upscale the model because it works. So, uh, years ago, uh, we wanted to create a system of innovation providing a framework that integrates key science, technology, and innovation institutions. And we wanted to provide a framework integrating all these elements uh, trying to, to generate new knowledge and share this knowledge. That's why we propose a new action that it's called Chartec Salud. Chartec Salud is the health tech innovation network of Catalonia. This is a project in which uh, I was personally working for three months, uh, defining the project and looking for the right partners. And well, the idea of this project, Chartec Salud, was uh, bringing together research groups from various institutions, including hospitals, universities, and technology, uh, te technological centers. It was the first time that happened in our country, but my vision at this time was we cannot develop solutions only from university, we need to integrate the hospitals. We have a very good relationship with them. Patients participate. Uh, we test all the phases of the value chain with them, but we want to integrate also their research with, with ours. So that's a key point. So this, it start, because it continued, it start at, well, it start with the, with the COVID. It was so difficult because uh, uh, we had to hire a team of seven people uh, 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 online, but, but it worked. But the, the relevant idea is that 47 research groups from different, from 17 institutions were integrated in this network. Each research group is a node of this network. Obviously, it was difficult because our interaction is only with the research groups, not with the institutions. So obviously, we had to negotiate with the innovation departments and the transfer technology departments of these institutions in order to be allowed to negotiate and to talk uh, directly with them. But uh, they, they gave us um, that confidence for doing that because we tried to offer different services than the services that they provided. So, we look for the underground of, of each new technology in order to create this middle ground. Uh, and, well, we start to define that as a, as, a, as a regular project. We define the mission, we define the vision. So we want to be, we had the vision of, okay, it starts in Catalonia, but we want to grow up the project. But the values are the commitment to support innovation, responsibility, to avoid brain drain and generate career opportunities for talent. This is one of the focuses of our project. We form very good, good students. Most of them live to, to countries where, well, they, 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 they are well paid, like Germany, Nordic countries, and we cannot retain them. So we thought that maybe encouraging their personal projects that they start to explore in their masters, degrees, thesis, and in their PhD works, so maybe we could retain them. And also collaboration to promote synergies between research group institutions, hospitals, and companies. After that, this period, so it was the, the phase one, we open a second phase. We are currently here. 
we decided to scale up to, instead of 47 research groups, to 81, including the most relevant institutions in research. For example, the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, one of the most relevant uh, supercomputing um, uh, facilities in, in Europe, uh, the, the, the top hospi hospitals in, in the area, also, for example, the Medical Association of Barcelona was invited to be part, the Association of Bioinformatics in Barcelona that it connects, for example, with, there's a master's degree that it's offered by, by the most relevant universities in the city. So we try to integrate that. And, well, we start to focus. Uh, the first, the first um, step was the talent. So as I said, it's super important to train our PhD students, researchers, and spin-off founders. Also, we are moving to, to, to the master's students. Then we start to work in the idea validation. So we, we start to scout all the labs looking for good ideas that could be implemented. So we start to scout the best technologies, potential technologies that could solve good, um, in, a, in a good way the, the, the challenges that exist nowadays. Then we develop co-creation strategies, valorization strategies, and finally all the tech transfer, okay? Uh, we did many things. We accelerated in, in, in a brief time, in two years, 30 projects. Uh, obviously, uh, there's a team. There's a team now of, of we are six people. Uh, we work in different silos, in vertical builder, patents call, valorization call, and events call. We organize many things, formative sessions, like some of them. We have an incubation training, an entrepreneurship academy, general training. We organize co-creation events. Uh, this is a big event that uh, we designed that started last year and it will take place in, in a month. It's a Health Tech 2030. The idea is thinking about what is going to impact in 2030 from the healthcare uh, uh, sector. Innovation challenges, hackathons, we organize all of that for attracting, detecting students with motivations that we can train for, for, for developing new, new solutions. An observatory, we decided to, to write a white book that we're going to present in a month to analyzing the sector. So we are, we are, we can define ourselves as an underground or, but we, we want to go, to, to go up and, and, and to be part, to be a voice, uh, giving voice to all the researchers because most of the time the research groups are not visualized. They don't have presence in many of the forums. We, we can give this voice. And finally, so we were very ambitious and we decided to create our Venture Builder program. So we are opening the call now for, the, for, the, for this year's edition. But in 2021, we supported six companies from different research groups. Uh, and also in 2022, we supported five more. Uh, well, um, it worked very well. In fact, the, the, Catalan, uh, the Catalan government, the government of my region, they totally believe in that. And they initially, the, the first part of the project was funded by the European Commission, half and half by the Catalan government. And the Catalan government said, no, we cannot wait for funds from the European Commission. We want to put all the money by ourselves. So they are 100% supported by our government, so it's good. And I want to show you some of the companies. This is Able Human Motion. This is the first lightweight, easy to use, and affordable exoskeleton that restores the ability to walk of people with lower limb paralysis. Uh, this is Ricard, one of our pilots. And well, it is going this, this exoskeleton after five years of, of activity of this uh, spin-off will be certified to enable individuals with spinal core injury at levels from C5 to L5 to perform ambulatory functions under the, the supervision of a trained therapist. So you need a trained therapist for assisting you in the use of this exoskeleton, but they are working in a new generation. Uh, the second one solution is totally different. It connects with gastronomy. Uh, the case is one of our researchers working in, uh, in the biomaterials lab. 
he found a solution for printing uh, with a 3D printing a plant-based protein and he created the first steak, plant-based steak. It was very successful. In fact, uh, yeah, it, it took the attention of, of, of the mass media and he's offering this product with the most uh, relevant restaurants in the city with, well, he worked with Fran Adria, he also worked with Ossiere Can Roca in Girona, uh, with this Frutar, and now we are, they, they've created their, their, their factory for producing the meat, but they are so developing the business model because they are selling the 3D printer with all, all the kit for printing at home the, these steaks. And a third example for finishing this part, uh, this is one of the examples from the video game industry. They, they usually work in, in the in the entertainment industry, and they finally uh, start to develop serious games and gamification solutions. And, and they observe that there's a gap for the training and uh, the technical and soft skills uh, uh, of, of, of clinicians. So they start to develop this solution. Uh, BIRMEDEX provides the next generation training platform for high performance risk aware professionals. This is, uh, this is uh, the perfusionist machine that you use in an open heart surgery. So they gamified all the process so you can learn uh, using this game. And well, it's, it's, it's one of the, our spin offs that is growing up very quick. And having said that, having presented that, I thought about transferring and showing with you five lessons that I learned uh, and taking as a, as a starting point the examples I, I show you. The first one is, technology, is related to the technology life cycle S-carf. S-carf in the context of the technology life cycles refer to a graphical representation of the adoption and growth of a new technology or innovation. It typically illustrates how a technology progresses and is adopted over time. The sweet spot, the yellow part, in this context refers to the phase of rapid growth or acceleration. So usually, there's a slowest start, that's the innovation phase, and that's the phase in which we are interested uh, from Chartec Salute. In this initial phase, the technology or innovation is introduced and its growth is slow. But obviously, it's only of interest for high research and early adopters that are typically tech enthusiasts and innovators, okay? And they want to, to use it. So it's, it's interesting for us, it's the right moment for, for taking the technology and start to think how to use it to impact in the market. The second one is a rapid growth the adoption phase as the technology gains momentum and it enters a phase of rapid growth. More people are, start to be interesting, adopting the technology and it becomes more widely accessible. And the second one, I sorry, the, the last one is the maturation. It's the final phase in which the growth starts to level off. Okay? So here it's widely adopted. So examples, from the 60s, we, we've observed analyzing different technologies that always the pattern is the same. We see there's several innovation cycles for different technologies, nanotech, biotech, but also now obviously there's artificial intelligence. What's the learning about that. What is happening at the beginning? What is happening at the top of the curve? Well, so as I said, the first part is the disruption. So it means an opportunity. It means an opportunity if you have access to the technology, you understand the technology and you see the potential of the technology. And the sweet spot is the area in which, in the examples we've seen, many of the big known companies stay and, well, they try to exploit the technology and to, that's, that's why the strategy of these big corporates is, okay, if I couldn't develop a solution for that, so I try to, to buy it, okay? Second learning, 
I want to use this, I want to use this kanji characters. This is, it means obaitori, this is one of the Japanese words I like. So it's, it's, um, it's the kanjis are used in Japanese concepts to convey concepts. I like that. And yeah, you see here, obaitori, it comes from the kanji characters for the four trees that blossom in spring. The cherry, the plum, the peach, and the apricot. And it's very interesting because each flower blooms in its own time. And the meaning behind this says that we and the projects grow and bloom at our own pace. And this is important to understand it. We've been incubating a project for 14 years. One of the projects I show you, 14 years. And they expect to launch their product in three years. But it's a, it's a minimal invasive uh, surgical uh, robot. It wants to compete with Da Vinci, you know, maybe Da Vinci, the Da Vinci robot. So, but we understood that from, from the beginning. And the team developing that solution also knew that. So, Obatori act as a reminder that each person and project has their own journey through life, and we should focus on their growth and not compare ourselves so much with others. So, try to focus on your project and understand that, well, your project is unique, but believe in that. Well, we need to provide spaces for experimentation, and each project has its own unique rhythm. Third, successful innovation is first and most importantly about creating value. You need to understand that. You need to create value with the solutions you want to implement. This is, uh, he was one of my, 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 my teachers uh, years ago, Kenneth Morse from the MIT Entrepreneurship Center. He, he created the, the MIT Entrepreneurship Center. And I love how he defines innovation. Innovation for him is invention plus commercialization. Because this commercialization makes reference to, pay, to the open innovation vision. Okay? So we need to focus our strategy. And what I try to do in, my, in, in this research center is to focus my strategy on that. Trying to understand how to impact economically and socially how to develop new business models. Because finally, as, as innovators, we are like futurologists. We try to predict the future because it will be released in one year, two years, but they need to think about which is the best business model for that time. Well, here is exactly the same. We have our, our audience, we have our users, audience music here. And well, we, they stay there, you, st you stay in front of them, and it's difficult to, 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 to get that situation. So they sleep with you, they love to stay with you, they are, well, fantastic. So this is the dream, but the challenge is totally different, okay? So um, we look for clients, the clients are there. We ask them, what do you, what do, do you want? They don't know what they want. And the worst is that, when do you want it? We want it now. That's reality. So we don't know what, to, what they want, and we only know that they want it now. Well, these are the times that we are living, so we need to reframe the challenge. So we need time about discovering more about them. So there are a lot of methodologies, it's not the, the, the focus of this talk. But what we know that this is something that it's one of the last studies that were published. Uh, it analyzed uh, the US consumers in, 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 in the last months. So what we see is that obviously, if we move to the golden seniors, to the millennials, what we discover is that the new generation, so the centennials, and those of you with kids under 10, the alphas, the alphas, uh, well, 
consider company values when making a purchase. So it is so important. So the 70% of millennials have this information into account when they decide what to buy. Because finally, as a consumer, you are supporting a project. You are supporting uh, a vision. That's why I like what Ludeke Freund does. I, I, I like him from the, from the University of Berlin. And I like this theory uh, because it's so simple, but he puts all the relevance in the values-based innovation. So what he tries to demonstrate here is the potential of values to integrate diverse stakeholders into innovation processes, to direct collaborative efforts and to generate innovations with a positive impact on societal challenges. So the customer values, we need to understand their customer values because we need to offer a value proposition, but it must be real. What we try to say and what we try to do with our startups and, and spin-offs is that you must believe that and you must align your values with the values of your consumers. If not, it's washing, pink washing, green washing, but it's not real. Maybe it works in the short time, but not in the middle term. Okay, then you can upscale this vision to the strategic, to the strategy of your company, introducing it in the corporate values, developing a business model innovation that uh, uh, incorporates that. And, and finally, so it has to be implemented in the vision and the, in the vision and the mission. So the idea is that the main idea behind that is values-based innovation is to ensure that technological advancements and creative solutions align with and promote positive values. That's the final idea of that. This is one of the examples I like it. So I try to, uh, as you've seen, I, I also stay at the SMOOC and, and I usually am invited by music festivals. This is a music festival I attended last year. Uh, it takes place in a rural environment, in a small village. And the idea of this festival is putting in value the rurality, the diversity, and the tradition. So what they want is that all the people, they burst, stay and come back to the, to the villages. That's the idea. So this is called the agroqueer uh, Dauyoa, the name is, 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 is that, agroqueer, no, agroqueer, so it's like a bad translation in Spanish, so they play with that, agroqueer, Dauyoa. And what they like from here is that they decided to fund the festival with the money from the audience. So they don't receive any, any, any money from any institution. If not, the audience collaborates, because all the activities are for free, collaborate putting money in a crowdfunding uh, website. And also, all the shops, all the restaurants collaborate with the festival from that uh, uh, rural area. So it is nice, and I want to finish this part with what Sally Krauchek, she has been called the most powerful woman on Wall Street. She was a former head of Bank of America's Global Wealth and Investment Manage Management Division. She created the and, and she says, if it comes down to your ethics versus a job, choose ethics. You can always find another job. Personally, I totally align with that. So maybe that's why I prefer to stay at the academia. Fourth point, uh, uh, cross-fertilization of knowledge and technologies. This is part of my PhD research that uh, I did. Um, I tried to define this, this cross-fertilization as a recombination of previously separate concepts. So the idea is combining and looking for the intersection of knowledge fields, yields a fertile breeding ground for new ideas with different origins that can cross-fertilize, and we can create new knowledge. So if I take the ideas and I cross ideas, I can create new knowledge, then I can cross that with new technology, and if, if I complement that, I can offer new solutions that could be commercialized. Well, uh, what I try to do when I analyze that is uh, I analyze mm, 
90 European projects, including serious games and gamification uh, companies. For a three years period, I included 320 organizations and 600 observations. And well, I tried to understand how is the clustering and, and, and how, you, how you create a successful uh, consortium for developing and working together in a new solution. This is what I try to understand. It is published in this article. And well, I, uh, this is an example of the conclusions of that. So I try to, to summarize that uh, with, with some interesting co uh, conclusions. For example, the first one on the, on the right, larger knowledge and technological distances. One of the evidences was that it was important to put in contact partners with a large knowledge and technological distance. So many of the times we see our, our closer teams trying to find people so close to their knowledge, to their language. And the interesting thing is looking for people with a big technological distance to you. Well, we also detected how stronger knowledge and technological efforts, efforts are important. It's important to have access to external information, so you create a consortium, but maybe you need more additional information, more additional knowledge. You need to open the uh, uh, links to connect with other people. And users participate at different stages of the value chain. I, I analyze the presence of the end users or patients, depending on the project, testing the, the different uh, stages of a project. So this is very important to, to, to have their involvement in, in all the project. In fact, the European Commission in, in, Horizon, in, in, in Horizon 2020 is encouraging the presence of, 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 of users, final users or passion organizations. Also having previous collaborative experience, it's good. Greater number of doctors in the collaborating organizations was detected as, as a positive impact in the consortiums. Informal types of collaboration networks, importance of high cultural diversity. Customer being prioritized, having experience in, in higher technology readiness levels. You know, this classification from NASA that was adopted by the European Commission. And market-oriented projects. And finally, last, last thing, it, it's related to that, but it's not exactly the same. It's a cross-industry innovation. I've chosen this, this article because I, I, I consider that this figure is so visual. This is from this team. Uh, and they propose that most of the times, uh, if you look at the intersection of the problems of one sector with the source of solution of a non-related sector, there's always an intersection. It could be so small, but maybe there, it's the most interesting for finding new solutions. So you, what you can do when you source, uh, when, when you look for solving problems, so you, can, you need to abstract. This is so difficult because many of the times that's the big trouble that we've detected in, in our experience because you need to abstract. You invested a lot of time there with that technology, but maybe, okay, you need to look at technology from the distance. So if you abstract, you can find analogies in that intersection. And finding these analogies, you can take one of their solutions and adopt it. And maybe it's, it's not difficult. You can do it. Obviously, um, it, it's interesting, it's good. When, when I encourage my students to, to start to do that, I encourage them to work with benchmarking analysis, but extending the benchmarking analysis, because most of the time you focus on similar solutions or similar companies to, to, to you when the most relevant, the most interesting is exploring other universes, okay? So some solutions, this is one of the company that I also collaborate with them, Nixie for Children. Nixie for Children help hospitals create better experiences for its patients. With virtual reality preparation, we help reduce the anxiety caused by the hardest moments of medical treatments, a surgery preparation for kids and, the, and their families, an oncology treatment, ETC. 
And also my last example is one of the projects I'm developing with the government of the Canary Islands. Uh, it's, it's totally focused on culture. Synapsis is a project aimed at promoting innovation and entrepreneurship for all stakeholders within the lives art sector in the Canary Island. In fact, most of them are musicians, performers, uh, people from theater, dance, dancing companies. And this initiative aims to expand the scope of life arts by fostering cross-sector relationships. So the idea was defining a call with the, with, the, with the government of the Canary Islands to attract projects crossing sectors, promoting the cross innovation in a, in a sector that is the life, the life art sectors that usually for them is so difficult to connect with others. So the idea of this call is selecting the 10 best uh, projects that will support, will mentor these projects because uh, the, the government in the Canary Islands uh, wants to create a new scene of industry. They want to create something new. And they know that maybe crossing this sector, instead of putting the money to give, um, to give a subsidy to the sector, they prefer to, to promote this movement. It is interesting because uh, they are pushing, obviously, with an economic incentive, but the response is super interesting because the sector must move to, to offer new solutions. Finally, conclusion uh, of these five practices. So please, according to our experience, I encourage to understand the specific moment of each technology, life cycle, scarf, artificial intelligence. Where is artificial intelligence? We are at the sweet, at the sweet spot, but be careful. So many people start to be interested in that. It always comes to my mind uh, that idea of Groucho Marx. If you go to the barber and the barber told you about that, uh, about artificial intelligence, it's not, the, it's not the best thing, okay? Second one, Ovaitori, each project has its own journey and we should focus on its own growth and not compare ourselves so much with others, celebrating our project, individuality and uniqueness. Okay, focus on your project. Obviously, you need to consider the context. It's so important, but focus on that. Values-based innovation, technological advancement, advance, advancements and creative solutions align with and promote positive values, such as social responsibility, sustainability, inclusivity, and ethical considerations. And it seeks to drive innovation that benefits both individuals and society as a whole. Fourth, cross-fertilization of knowledge and technologies. Create teams with larger knowledge and technological distances. If we combine different areas of knowledge and technology, these teams can explore new and innovative solutions. So encourage them because maybe you work with these teams, but they need this external view. So you can promote this matching. And cross industry innovation, look for ideas, concepts, or technologies from one industry to another, unrelated or different industry. Personally, I like this matching with unrelated sectors. This is the most interesting. If you want to waste your time exploring that, go to, that, to these intersections. And that's all. Thank you so much. And I'm open to your questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manel. So, any questions? I actually have one, or but Pale also has one, so, yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Manel. I was interested in that sweet spot, the acceleration in the curve, uh, where you said that's where you go in, or the incubators or the support, uh, is that because that's the most profitable phase or because help is most needed in that phase or maybe some other reason? Well, well because the technology is starting to be accepted so you can develop solutions for, for biggest targets of, 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 of customers and, and yeah, the, you can find a return uh, in terms of 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 of, prof of profits, 
So that's, that's why it's more interesting. So because at the beginning of the curve, uh, it's interesting, but the implementation of the technology requires be tested, so it's not clear how to be success. But if you wait a little bit and you observe and you learn from the rest of the experiences, you can define a better strategy to implement and to impact with that technology. So, so the mechanisms needed before that are more like research support and the university structures to develop the technologies to, to that point. Yeah, that is a traditional uh, point. I love that it happens at the university because some of the times happen in big corporates, but big corporates most of the time don't share this knowledge. So personally, I prefer to invest the money. So I encourage governments to put the money in universities and research centers because we disseminate all this knowledge. And, and yeah, it's, it's a more open strategy for everybody. Yeah, my, my question is um, related to this notion that, as you mentioned, this overcrossing, right? I mean, you have to know your sector and your um, discipline, let's say. Also, as we see, it's very useful to kind of have a wider understanding and co collaborate people from other disciplines. However, if we talk about the current education, which is quite often very specialized, also starting in the school even sometimes, uh, also in universities. Uh, what do you think about the balance between, you know, disciplinary and interdisciplinary? <laughs> how, how we could improve? Because, I mean, as, as there is external world, there is also our internal world. And we have our interests and <laughs> our brain. So we have to be like um, specialists in some case, uh, cases, but we might also understand much more fields. However, if it's too much, maybe then, you know, it's kind of <laughs> hard to manage that. What, is there some kind of, to your understanding, like, a, like this golden point <laughs> of a combination of, you know, disciplinary versus interdisciplinary or, or like your field versus other fields? Well, this is, this is a discussion open in, in the universities when we try to offer very specific bachelor's degrees or masters, super specialized. Yeah, the, my personal opinion, according to, to what I see, is that I always encourage to, to, to take the, the most traditional bachelor's degrees, mathematics, physics, economics, because after that, if you understand the basis, it's like coming back to the, to the classics. So if you understand the basis of everything, so you can adapt your knowledge to the specific requirements of a field. So, uh, yeah, I think, I think but, but I think that all the knowledge that you don't have can be found anywhere. So the interesting thing is, is uh, I remember a conversation with, with Florin yesterday, we talked about that, the importance of creating a good team. And a good team is creating, is created when you share the same values. This is so important for me, because then you can adapt this knowledge and you complement this knowledge. But that's why I insisted, that's why I love this idea of Ludwig Freund of values-based innovation, because he bases all the strategy of innovation in values. And, and I think that's, that's one of the key points to have into account for the next years. If you don't align these values of your proposal with, with your customers, or if you only are washing, uh, it's not going to work. Maybe it works in the, in the short term, but not in the future. I don't know if I... Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I think things similarly. Yes. Yes. Um, thank you for the uh, for the presentation. My question is, um, uh, well, it's amazing uh, innovation ecosystem that you have there. But um, my question is about practicality of um, practicalities of involvement of industry of corporations. Like, how does that actually work with universities? Like in Latvia, for example, we face a lot of difficulty uh, when it comes to. Uh, integrated in, um, industry because there are many restrictions, for example, especially if there are 
are labs financed by EU, for example, like there is the restriction of like who can access those labs and like how, what kind of resources can be used by private entities within universities and so on. Maybe you have some uh, uh, experience to share like what is the good way how to bring in the uh, industry. Well, for long years, I, I tried to attract uh, the, the big corporate industry in order to develop projects together. But what I discovered, me and, and, and my, my team, is that the best thing was pushing our technologies, creating startups and spin-offs. So we think it's better. So sometimes it's so difficult because we did tech, tech transfer but most of the time we license the technology and they paid less for that because they always negotiate with you they don't want to pay and finally you discover that with that license they've developed a, a product very success and they are benefiting a lot but you don't see any money so we finally say no we need to create our companies so we wanted to redefine the ecosystem. That's why in Barcelona it's a vibrant ecosystem from the startup's point of view. It's a good place. So many people from all around the world, Australian, Americans, Canadians, decide to establish themselves in Barcelona. Uh, we, don't, we don't have a specific tax policy. It's not the best one. But there are other factors that encourage the creation of, of spin-offs. And that's why this network is focus mainly on, on the creation of spin-offs because we want to change things and, and if we don't do it, the industry is not going to do it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. you. Okay, so we continue this theme of, um, in a way, connection to well-being and music <laughs> and startups. And uh, let's welcome Jeanette, who will talk about all of that. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Is it okay if I sit? Because <laughs> we are not allowed today. So yeah, my name is Jeanette. I'm probably the only one person in this forum not from music and not the lecturer from university and probably the only one representing business. So um, I'm so glad that I'm speaking after Mr. Manel because I was thinking how to present myself. I'm always thinking before every conference. Um, like 10 years ago, I was a visioner, then I was middleman, middlewoman, and now I know who I am. I'm fertilizer because Basically, CEO or co-founder is just a title. It, um, it's much more how, how that business is run. And also differently from the university practice, because I've been studying, I know how it looks. Every day when we think about something and have no ideas, create a valid proposition, at the end of the day, we need to think in business, how we are going to pay the salaries. Uh, how we are going to make a profit, how we are going to raise the money. And yeah, so basically I envy almost everybody through all the days uh, watching presentations. When Andres was talking about the um, artificial intelligence in music, I was thinking if we had money to do that, but we don't, I think we will find. So yeah, so um, if I'm not a musician, uh, how I got into the music industry, and as I said, I'm not, as I'm not from the um, scientific field, I decided to show you the business case, which is based just on music, all the pillar stars in music and how it was changing, developing, and what do we have now? So, um, so basically, yes, about the opportunities of the soul ecosystem of of, of music. So pop one, how everything started. So me, myself, I was studying international relations and political science. I became a diplomat as I knew that it's very difficult to 
to dive in that world, I also studied law and I did my master's in um, UNESCO Chamber for Cultural Policy. And then uh, I needed money because in Lithuania, I'm, by the way, I'm from Lithuania, um, the people in governmental institutions are not very well paid and I just decided that I will do business. And I did the most probably stupid business in the world. So I created the company, I found the investment, they left me some shares and found the musicians, found the Python developers, they created for me a code, created a solution, I recorded 500 MIDI files and started to sell ringtones for phones. It was really simple, no challenges and lots of lots of money. But of course, when Nokia went away and we um, saw the first smartphones, I started to think how I can um, change and where I can go. And um, as I was in constant cooperation with the producers because they were making for me media files, I decided that, okay, now maybe I should go back to cultural diplomacy because these musicians were very talented from Lithuania. And maybe somehow to use the power to what I always wanted to do. More peace in the world, like to show to everybody that we have soft weapons, which is culture, and we don't need to fight, and we don't need drones, and we don't need to kill people to live like happily all together on Earth. So, so yeah, I started to be um, part two, the manager and... Um, director for the company where was the main person um, let's say the most like maybe the richest these days the most profitable in royalties in Lithuania music producer and composer so we did everything we did um, Lithuanian voice and all alike projects creating music producing uh, providing the soundtracks for TV shows we created a label from we had approximately 20 artists we had concerts from big halls to small concert halls in little towns. Approximately 20% of all played music on radio was belonged to our label. And that music composer, producer, as he has the classical music background, he was doing also in the mean, um, time from time theater performances. And yes, we did that. Had a lot of people, a lot of events. And then, like, as I was CEO of that company. I mean, you need, like, despite the fact what you do, you need to show the growth. I mean, this is how business works. And um, like the money is the same, the same, the same. Then we had the crisis of 2008. People stopped to go to concerts. People stopped to buy records. And the business was decreasing. And then I just, again, remember what I studied. I studied law. So I just took extra course in copyright law and I realized that we have a huge problem in Lithuania. We just get money from the actual things, like you produce a song in a studio and then you send it to TV producer, you go to the concert. But if no less than 20% of all music that belongs to our label is played on the radios, streamed on the radios and on TV, so we can see it from cue sheets, so where is the money? So that leads me to another part of the music opportunities, which probably is the most difficult so far uh, challenge I had during the 21 year of, of being in music um, business. So like 23 hours per day, people are, per week, people are listening to music and they use it in work while commuting to work. So, I mean, everybody's using, where is the money that I, FBI global report says it's 26 billion. The report is for today, but uh, I'm talking about the situation 11 years back. But the amount was approximately, but was about 20 billion. So who gets the royalties? And, um, and yeah, post-Soviet countries, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, has so many difficulties for laundering money from the royalties and delivering them to the people uh, who has nothing to do with art or with the public performance of, of art, in this case, music. And um, 
And yeah, we went to Brussels. We did changes. We lobbied the change in law because uh, in post-Soviet uh, Union countries, they somehow managed to implement the monopoly in the law. And uh, like no producer or composer or any other rights holder could make their own agency and sell their own songs. It was just two, uh, as I say, bad heritage from Soviet Union, two organizations, collective management organizations that were doing it and you never see the money. So yeah, so we fight it for five years. I constantly, like three days a week, was sitting in the court. Um, I sued basically everyone in Lithuania, the main national televisions and radios. And yeah, in one case I won like 130,000 euros. I mean, it, it, I won a lot of cases. So let's say I went into the biggest um, music industry war in Lithuania. I won a lot of battles but I still lost the war because um, musicians and creators and artists themselves were not ready for the change. Um, we lack knowledge. They go to study composition or music production or singing, performance, whatever. Now they are told a little bit about what rights they have. And still, as I do a lot of charitable work, I approximately 10 calls, 8 calls a day, consult musicians for free, you know, how they how they should sign the contract, what clauses are important and so on and so on. So yeah, so that time business was just going on. I was constantly fighting in courts and after that, like part four, we created our own collective management organization. We've been fighting, bleeding, and we needed to get out of the box somehow because Lithuania was not ready for a new model, new type of royalties collection, and also transparency. We have a lot of problems with transparency. And yeah, there is a saying, when they close you the door, you open the window, and then we are at the part five, from which one is just everything started to grow more and more, and to flourish in the most possible ways. So we created company, which is B2B company. So basically background music solutions for businesses. So finally we changed the law. Uh, we have independent labels and artists from all around the world, from San Francisco to New York, from New York to Sydney, like independent artists and independent labels who agreed not to register some of their songs recordings at the collective management societies and to give to our company Shakespeare Music direct representation and which empower us to license them and we created the, the alternative music licensing system basically in Europe. We were the first company who did that and everything looks very nice from the beginning because we have Grammy winners, we have famous jazz musician from Finland, we have the voice winner in Australia. So nice, talented people, they trusted, they gave these songs because I said to them, I will bring you money. Because this is the business, how the business works. You give your product, you give your babies and I'll try to employ the music and to bring you money. So of course then, as in university or innovation management or business management studies, you create a plan and you do what you need to do. So I did everything about the background music because I knew the law. I created a team of uh, sales team, the value proposition, and uh, we started to do the meetings, but they said it's enough, not enough because at that time we coded the music streaming platform, which means that if you are a restaurant and you want to play our music, you need to press play from the streaming platform, like Spotify. And our businesses said, no, 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 no. Uh, if you want to sell that, so let me to forget anything with music. I signed a contract, we agree on the music playlist and type of music and the mood the end customer needs to get, and this is it. So then, I contacted people who were manufacturing Raspberry Pi in in England. Uh, I took that simple, empty 
Linux computer and we wrote a code um, which like made us have the that device infrastructure so what we do we send that simple device to the client they plug it into the power supply internet and amplifier and this is it like if it's the working hours are from eight we play music from eight automatically and so on and so on and yes business started to flourish if you start your journey f- here in Vilnius from from the river at Gediminov Avenue the main street here to the cathedral so every second location is playing Shakespeare music then we went to um, a little bit in Sweden, Poland, Estonia, Latvia, we still can't walk as we have fights and courts. We didn't manage to change the law and they still think that they can have monopoly. So we give for businesses music for free in Latvia, our artists know it. So we can proceed on fighting and showing that businesses want to choose and according to that law they can't choose. And yes, and um, it was just business, 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 sales, 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 sales. And uh, when company lives better and have extra resources, then we looked again out of the box. If we just, even if we have the best client support and, and really nice solution, we will not survive the competition if we will not uh, adapt to the trends, to technological trends, to the trends of how people see the music, how technology is transforming what is the music what is the background music it's not the same background music which was 20 years ago and as still you of course understand that like deep learning projects or even simple research or study costs a lot so we got financing of almost 1 million euros from european union funds and did a very very nice research uh, which I think has started to help for our business to, to go into another stage of flourishing. So basically when we have, like when our salespeople go to business people, they say in their words what music they would like to be played in the premises. Like what is the customer? And you know, for a person who is the lover of soft pop, music with a, a bit sharper guitar is rock or hard rock. So they say, I don't want hard rock. Or people can sometimes, because they are from business, sometimes they can say, it's just, uh, I want only female vocal. Okay, but what genre? So they don't know anything. So basically, it's like math. If you go to school, you learn math. If you don't go to university to learn music, you cannot describe the things like how they should be. And then we thought, what is the most important thing what we do? So we sell a value proposition so basically businesses will sell more if they allow us to put an extra value on customer experience so the most important thing is how people feel when they come to that restaurant or shop or automotive or beauty salon and then i found a study oxford study made by professor david grimberg who had 38 uh, descriptions for music like joyful cheerful sad and so on and so on and we didn't still have amount to keep on these emotions so we narrowed it to our business case to 12 emotions and five emotional influences like from low to intense uh, we did a research there were Mantotas was as well in that research from the music academy of theater because we need the theoretical background how the professionals see measure the music then we ran um, we ran the test in the lab so there were several hundred participants who came into the lab and they were the music was played to them and they needed to describe what they think then the professional tags the people tags were given as two outputs for the data scientists who wrote the algorithm and how they correlate together and how they um, detect the according to these two inputs the emotional level of music so each time we upload the people who work with um, admin upload the song at um, our database so each time the song also uh, has a request to another cloud where the algorithm the deep learning algorithm is giving the uh, the title like the tag of the emotional intensity Uh, so i would say that um, it was it changed a little bit that 
we can our people can make playlists a bit easier because they know the emotional and influence and we have from our clients information how much they want to influence the people at the store for example if the store is very very luxury one and at every one meter they have sales assistants so they need less influence of music because they train the people to sell the best at that luxury store if it is like some i don't know middle price store they lack of Uh, human resources there so they want people to occupy to be influenced when the right traffic hours the people want to move fast they ask us to play fast music and so on and so on and so on but uh, we need to repeat that the research we did because um, as we had the input of the music people are listening these days uh, 90% of music listened these days is uh, with lyrics and as it ba- as background music will use a lot of classical music soundtracks which is just instrumental so that algorithm was trained according to the tr- musical trends people are listening now and to one of the most valuable and influential soundtracks we have in our database that's giving the lowest emotional intensity level just because we trained it on on the trends people are doing so yeah so it looked everything just amazing we got a huge team of developers front end back end data scientists and then part 6 the covid and the lockdown as our main business was to do the background music in physical locations they were closed so then again we have the music we have people they can work so we just quickly upgraded and capitalized our assets so the same soundtracks i just contacted the right holders that now i need your permission to not only for public performance but for the synchronization they gave the permissions we started to sell music for videos for games for for documentaries then uh, some of the companies are using the luxury when they are closed we started to do the acoustic installations in shops like because they will reopen and they needed to be refurbished and sound treatments and like really really infrastructure thing and then we also started to prepare what we heard from the clients where when we would go to the meetings that okay you can have the contract but offer me the ultimate customer experience which includes visual so then uh, we hired several people who did due diligence of all the possible signage solutions then we got into the contracts but it was still like more preparation some of the work at the acoustic installation and like new capitalization of ads, assets of the synchronization licenses and then part 7 so if music is universal language and we can the same soundtrack sell in that many ways bring so m- more money to the creators and um, and and create that like like you know to build another house on one house only from one the same soundtrack uh we we went uh, i forgot to say that these years i already moved to london so now i'm almost seven years in london so secretly because it was a lockdown i went to business club i pitched the idea so if we know how music is influencing our emotions give us money we will make the application where music will be included but of course i mean it was totally different approach uh, the music has stopped so it means the time has finished uh, so i'll try quickly to to finish so uh, so yes and then again so that was that app of innovation so i did due diligence of everything that is across the world of all the applications of all the solutions of non medical apps that can help people so it started again from music but we topped up um, we created yours app while being application we t- topped up other different content but basically it's not only about the content it's about the approach that we can have healthy soul in a healthy body and healthy and vice versa so uh, this is how we raised our first million and then another one because because we we made every we we cooperated with the most famous psychiatrists and psychotherapists in the UK the famous yoga masters physiotherapists gp people from uh, from the hospitals and clinics and uh, 
musicians, composers, like all sorts of people that are dealing with our mind and our body. And our goal was like to create the content which together is in interconnected in that way that if you start one, and of course we have our our algorithm the algorithm depending on which one you would choose according to the questions you answered when you downloaded the app will offer you the second one so from business perspective we have amazing user, user engagement from human perspective people are feeling better because because only the things you do every day makes a difference so that was a goal how differently from from other other solutions in the market to force people to do something at least five minutes every day and here again music was the best tool because people are lazy from when they are born and when you say that you can reach almost the same level of relaxation just with soundtrack you don't need to breathe you don't need to meditate just listen to the soundtrack so they do so we lie a little bit and then they engage, engage, engage and go to another level. So yeah, so we did two parts, B2C and B2B. We went to workplaces because when we finished, it was approximately one year and a half, the lockdown finished, people came back to the hybrid working uh, places, which was very complicated, the level of anxiety and so on and so on. So we did that part next. So. Um, I don't know. I mean, today I'm talking with neuroscientists from Imperial College that definitely from what we have and how, because he was listening to our relaxing and focusing and sleeping music, he said that he already sees a pattern of vibroacoustics, which sometimes, which is deliberately made by other companies and universities. So probably we will, we will do that development. Um, we will still innovate and probably I will never get away from music. And to finish everything, thank you so much. I would like to play a video which actually answers everything, in my opinion. Thank you. Imagine a world without music. It's not worth thinking about, is it? Music can fill our hearts with joy, transporting us into a world of wonder. Music can entice us away from the busyness of life. Imagine a world without music. It's not worth thinking about, is it? Music can fill our hearts with joy, transporting us into a world of wonder. Music can entice us away from the busyness of life. Ensuring we're happy and at peace with ourselves. where we can dance like nobody's watching. Music can calm and focus us. Music is for every emotion we feel. Music gives us life. No matter who we are, choose yours. Yeah, so that is the answer where probably we would go this year, next year, and the other year. Uh, Mando does not have a microphone. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So, any questions? <laughs> yes. Okay. It is so interesting to listen to people working in the 
in the music field with, with this perspective of, of the startup and trying to to find new solutions to, to troubles. You finally commented on one that it's uh, uh, when you talk about this neuroscientist uh, looking for solutions for 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 sleeping troubles. So this is a common problem. So so. Um, <clears throat> What are you trying to do? It's, uh, uh, it, it kept my attention. So, what are you, because obviously this is, this is one of the big problems we have nowadays. So, could you tell us more, please? <laughs> uh, so, basically, yes. Um, so, also, the, that startup, the well being application, uh, I think that we needed it because, you know, there is quite a big problem when you go to YouTube and they, you can find videos. They say you can do that and that and that and that. And they often are made by amateur people, not necessarily leading you to better. And sometimes they're leading, and often they're leading to worse. So, that's why from the beginning, uh, all Basically, all the content is created by the professional people. Whether it is psychology bite, it is made by psychotherapists. And even if the butterfly hug is simple exercise, we can help ourselves to escape from anxiety every day. It is shown and made by famous psychotherapists. So, and when you are, so basically what you were talking about, your university, when you are surrounded by people, the tech people, the psychiatrists, the neuroscientists, the musicians, it leads always somewhere. And what we lack now, so we actually have several inputs, it should come with another update, that we track people's blood pressure and the pulse. So our so we could have another input in our deep learning matrix that how the content the content office should adjust to it. But in the meantime, the anxiety level grew by 80% only for last year and the worries and the stress level. So we decided that we need somehow to do to give immediate help for people to quickly fight it and uh, and you know the vibrations is i mean they 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 try they basically treat now alzheimer's and dementia with the with the vibroacoustics so yeah so what we want to do we want to create uh, extra gadget which would come like with the software you are using so they can uh, they can measure your stress level and immediately send that gadget uh, the vibration to lower blood pressure if it's needed to relax and to let stress down. And also, it, then it would be registered in your account in the application. And then your another day routine of the offered content and music and other units would be offered. So basically the goal is here, to, to connect the dots and to, because, and also this is quite a complicated thing because you know, I mean, and still we want to keep on non-medical thing, like the self-help thing. So, um, so, so now it's easy, quite easy to measure cortisol and uh, there is only one extra sensor at that device. So basically if we have the heart rate and the pulse and the cortisol level, so we see that person is under worry or under stress, so we send them uh, BPM to lower the heart rate because it's lowest when you are when you are under different vibration than your heart, but we also wanna them that thing to help to, for example, like focus. So yes, the focusing first stage is the relaxing, but then we need to increase the blood rate, and we don't want to play with a with a fire because then maybe person can have a heart attack. So we need to do a lot of things. So that's why we are contacted with the you're talking neuroscientists now, how we're going to solve it and how we're going to do it. Or it should be like two different toys, one for that, one for another. Like easy things, super, super cheap to produce and so everybody could afford to have. Yeah. Thank you. A uh, little question for me, mm, both in the context of, uh, uh, let's say, Shakespeare music and your sap, uh, and in the context of the fact that people are similar, right? But people are also different. Uh, like uh, something which works for one person might not work for somebody else. Uh, or like maybe there is also some cultural differences uh, in different countries. So what are your main, let's say, principles to adjust to that? Because I don't know, I mean, maybe 
somebody calms down when listening to heavy metal <laughs> or <laughs> not necessarily the meditative music. Yeah, that's true. So, uh, so yeah, so then it means that we don't focus on minorities. We do the mainstream thing. And that is the, the question that it's, it raises every day, uh, whether the content is good if, I mean, if you cannot know exactly that is helpful for person. But each time when I have it, I talk to our chief psychiatrist, Dr. Jessamy Hibbert, and she says that we all are the same. It just depends how we are using the tools, how we are showing the, the value of something that might help you. So basically the thing is to convince people that it might help and somehow to force them to do it every day. This is it, it can be, it can be Pilates stretching exercise one per day and five minutes of relaxing music. This is it. And, and you can avoid like a lot of psychological difficulties, problems in the future, calm your, down your worries and, and a lot of things. So it's, it's a play like everything. We play as well. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Thank you. No, thank you very much. Finally, coffee. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. So, coffee break. We'll get back shortly.
Okay, so we're back and welcome, Pale. Thank you, Mantatas. Waiting for my screen to appear. Yay. So um, I'm the non PowerPoint person making th life difficult. So um, great to see you here. I'm going to give a sort of a philosophical perspective on AI. Um, I won't involve lots of uh, French philosophers or anything, but I will reason about it, uh, what it means and the consequences of what uh, these new technologies bring to music making. Uh, and I call it sort of a pragmatic, critical and visionary view of what machine learning and artificial intelligence brings to the table for art. Uh, pragmatic because analyzing what we are actually doing, what we can do, and what I myself are, am doing. Critical, because there are some problems about how people talk about AI today. No, they cannot paint like Van Gogh, uh, even though there are images that look like that. We can discuss a little bit why people say that. Uh, and what is really the role of humans in a situation of uh, machine agents. Uh, but that doesn't mean I don't like AI. Still visionary, both in the meaning of wanting to use them, and I am using them, uh, but also looking into the future, uh, maybe even the far future, who knows. So who am I who says this? Um, I'm a musician, I'm a trained composer, classically trained, instrumental, mostly electronic these days. I'm an improviser, very active as an improviser, a pianist, synthesist, but I also cheat in many other kinds of art. Uh, I've done a lot of computer graphics over the years and I collaborate a lot with other uh, art forms. I'm a researcher and I, did, I finished my PhD almost 20 years ago on this very topic, uh, a particular kind of uh, AI algorithms called evolutionary algorithms as a tool to compose music and to do sound design. And some of the findings there found their way in commercial applications, etc. I'm very much focused on musical interaction uh, this, uh, inventing and designing new instruments for improvisation for my own, my own use and others also. Uh, interaction technologies for ensembles, evolutionary computation still, uh, and also the theory and practice of uh, computational creativity, and that's what I'm talking about right now. I have a, a number of affiliations. Most uh, current or most uh, relevant maybe is I'm professor of interaction design and um, I was for 10 years associate professor in computer-aided creativity, but my university thought we don't have that topic officially, so when you become professor, we call it interaction design instead. But I'm also a compose, uh, composition teacher at the Academy of Music in Gothenburg. I'm adjunct professor of art and technology in Aalborg in Denmark, which is also a very relevant uh, topic. Uh, and this thing goes way back. I'm older than I look. Uh, I'm, I was a programming hacker starting in 1979 when I was eight uh, and at the same time I started studying classical piano and I started improvising very soon after that and in my programming during the early 80s I was super fascinated by creating generative graphics and to try to push how long it would sustain interest to continuously surprise the viewer looking for organic qualities etc and 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 that led me, and I also led, read some early uh, popular psycholo psychology literature on creativity. So from like the age of 12, I've been thinking about these things and I haven't stopped yet. Please tell me to stop at some point. Um, and being both musician, composer and researcher, I, I sort of got interested in, can, we, can I be a composer of composers? <laughs> That's sort of the meta question. Is that possible, interesting or meaningful? So that's why I'm doing these things. It's very much from the artist's perspective, from an inside perspective. So I'm going to go through a few topics. There's not a super clear uh, line here. If the slides are too small to read, please let me know and I can zoom in. It's not slides, but you know what I mean. So how did I end up at... Uh, looking at these things. Well, I learned at, at Academy how to compose a piece of music, and it could be an artist learning how to paint something. And then I create another piece of music, and then looking at the constant qualities of these, I learn, okay, what constitutes a good piece, right? 
uh, and how one writes several good pieces that also sustain interest over time. So I learn about variation and then I understand how a composer needs to develop to sustain interest or to sustain interest in my own uh, creativity. Uh, and from there you sort of start to think about, okay, how can I simulate a composer, not just generating one piece, but generate uh, many pieces that sustain interest over time. And then how can we understand and simulate many composers uh, and music as a phenom phenomenon, uh, sort of like general artistic progress, uh, which leads to, you know, the very humble uh, thought that, okay, we need to simulate life in its, all its complexities, which of course is impossible or at least very difficult. Um, so that's at least, you know, the, the, the process that led from starting to do manual composition, algorithmic composition, systems that generate multiple compo compositions or infinitely many and then understanding how the, do these systems need to work and studying how do we work to be able to do believable such systems. Um, and my methods are mostly actually artistic research, practice-based artistic research. Uh, I do develop technical systems that I analyze and uh, try to find out why they work. And I publish a lot of articles about these things, but also theoretical analysis and discussion like we're doing now. So we have a few facts. Al algorithmically generated art and music exist at various degrees of sophistication. And it has existed for a very long time. Composers and artists have used formal methods uh, for uh, creating artworks for centuries or even millennia, actually. Uh, but we have much more advanced tools now and that allow for more advanced results, more complexity, new kind of outputs, less orthogonal, meaning uh, we, we can uh, work with higher level abstractions. And as somebody said yesterday, I think we, this doesn't lead to better art, it leads to different art or different music, and that is the main thing. And the main point, it's the fact that humans are still evolved. Somebody mentioned virtual artists yesterday. Uh, I mean, there are still a bunch of humans behind those. They're not autonomous artists, uh, definitely not. Uh, and we'll go more into that. So uh, we, there are a lot of questions that we can ask. Will AI ever be independently creative? Is that possible, desirable, dangerous, interesting? Does it matter who made the art? And not only who, the nature of that who? Is algorithmic art meaningful in the sense of sort of empathy and feeling what the person, that there is a message from somebody to you as a listener? Um, I usually use the, the mind trick of thinking about provocation that usually I can't be provoked by something that happened in an algorithm, but I can be very provoked by a human saying something. So, so the same kind of feeling, do we need that kind of human agent behind an artwork? Um, and is it even art if it's not coming from a being of the same kind of my, as myself? Um, which is related to the question, is natural beauty art? Because it's not created by, by a human. Um, my personal definition of art since, I don't know, 25, 30 years is that art is a result of human effort which can be subject to reflection. It's a very open definition. But it contains a few keywords. Human, <laughs> can we get rid of that? Effort is also a keyword for me. Um, can we get rid of that? Or if not, what is effort for a machine? Computation, energy consumption, complexity, amount of information. I'm not entirely sure if I can even answer that. And to go on and understand sort of the perspective where I'm coming from, I'll just give you the one minute version of, of my theory of creative process, which is published in this chap book chapter here. Um, a creative process can be seen, I mean, this is not saying how things are, but it's one way to think of it, especially when tools and different media are involved. Uh, a creative process is a s kind of a directed search in a space of possibilities, and that space is defined by the medium, like musical score, audio file, etc. And the process is heavily affected by the the pathways defined by the tools I'm using. If I'm using a particular synth, it can produce a certain kind of sounds, and there are many sounds it can't produce. 
Uh, and I can combine that tool with other processing tools, etc., that can take me further to other points in this huge space of possibilities. When using these tools and learning how they work, I build cognitive models of these tools and I create some kind of predictive ability. It's not perfect, but it works a little bit uh, in the future. I can know that if I turn this knob, I will go there, so, so to speak. If I have very good cognitive models, I can actually maybe sit, just sit with closed eyes in a chair and think about, okay, what can I do? And, you know, basically prepare a whole piece without doing it and then do it. Then things never go exactly as you think anyway. But uh, that kind of predictive capacity is an important component of skill. Another important aspect in my uh, view on creativity is that it's a rep repeated translation between a conceptual model, meaning your idea of a work, of its sort of goal or a vision or some underlying principles, and the actual physical form, material form in front of you, the, the current form, like the ske current sketch or the current audio file or something like that. And it doesn't always go as you think, so then you look at that sketch, oh, this didn't work, but that part was good, let's promote that part and be part of the real concept and then you sort of change your concept and then you try to implement that and it goes like this in a circle. And you can apply that to solo improv in real time or to writing a symphony or writing a paper, it still works. And in these translations there are lots of ambiguities that happen uh, and of course other mechanisms as sort of aesthetic preferences and social expectations, cultural baggage, etc. Um, so that was the one minute version of that. Please read that chapter. It's an excellent book. Oops, I took it away too quickly. Computers and Creativity is a book. Um, technology and art in general is also a complex topic. Um, technology brings us tools to realize stuff that we could do before, but do it faster and better you know, word processors and Photoshop. And of course, it changes also the nature of the stuff we do, but it's still similar to previous tasks. Uh, it can be an information medium to sort of accommodate artworks. You, d you do a, a film and it's, so it's inside that medium, the technology of film projection, etc. But maybe most interesting is that it can be a medium for manifestation of ideas, ideas that are unique to this technology. Like if you, if you work with information technology and artwork, it can have as its substance the way it uh, subverts information flows, for example. So, uh, and this is an argument that you actually have to understand the technology uh, to be able even to think about what to do with the technology. You get new ideas, once you learn it, you, you realize what is actually possible to do, and you can do uh, realize much deeper ideas, which is maybe what I said in the next branch. <laughs> I'm going ahead of myself. Uh, now, a lot of people here already know a lot about AI, so I will just go super quickly uh, through that. Basically, there's hundreds of definitions, but ability of machines to imitate human cognitive functions, tasks we consider intelligent or exhibit intelligent behavior. There's the general AI, basically that an int artificial intelligence that can do anything, uh, solve all tasks. That is probably far away, but nowadays we're not so sure <laughs> with the latest versions of these uh, chatbots. Uh, and I won't go into the existential risks of this, but I have colleagues working on that. Um, specific AI is basically a, a system that's able to solve specific tasks, and um, that happened. It goes so fast. So my examples are already old, but you know, doing particular tasks within musical craft. Uh, but now we're already at using text prompts to generate text, uh, images, audio, etc., or more easily doing things that previously were hand-coded, as we heard yesterday, uh, where the machine learning is really hidden from the user, uh, mostly. Um, some people mix up the term algorithm, uh, all algorithms, oops, my software is messing with me. Uh, not all algorithms are AI, uh, but a lot of things playing with very simple algorithms are actually very similar to playing with very complex algorithms. Uh, and I won't go into all these things. I would mostly say that almost all we see today is within this category of algorithms. Deep learning, neural nets, um, which is a kind of machine learning. Um, and the main insight about 14 years ago was that uh, if you 
do many more layers of neural nets, which was possible because the GPUs, because of the gaming industry, had developed so fast. Suddenly you could do much larger nets and it turned out that they became so much better uh, based on that. They're actually constructed in the same way as before. Uh, and that has led to the current explosion. And you can use them in various configurations to generate stuff. And there are lots of ways to do that. And that is where you know people start to think that they are creative. Um, and the role of AI in algorithms can be very different. They, uh, I mean, typically a, a deep learning network uh, in, in, its, uh, in itself creates a transfer function or a classifier function from input to output. Uh, and they're often used to optimize things. Uh, but I'm much more interested in how we can use them to explore. But I also get to why that is very difficult. Okay, we should also remind ourselves uh, if, you know, art, uh, AIs can be creative, what is an artist and what, you know, what is it that gives us uh, the qualities of, of, of art? Art comes from process, it's not instantaneous, it takes time to paint a, a, a painting. Uh, sometimes I improvise on piano, yes, I create that music there and then, but I have practiced improvisation for 40 years. Uh, so, you know, there's always a creative process. During that process, we interact with our surroundings. There's input and output, streams of impressions, and also reactions on temporary forms of the artwork, etc. It's a complex feedback loop. An artist usually has something to say, consciously or unconsciously. There are values embedded in the output. Um, and I don't know what I meant by that, misspelled things, so I'll go on. Um, and hopefully the output is relatable uh, with some effort by the receiver. It conceptually relate to the world, to the inner world of the receiver or to the larger world, the outside world or to previous art. This is a, a long discussion. And, or also empathetically relate, meaning I watch somebody playing and I can realize that they're really struggling and they're doing their best and I, I can feel that because of mirror neuron systems and, and my personal experiences, how, it, how difficult it is to, to, to play and, and things like that. So, uh, can we do uh, AIs that are the same as in human artists, not just imitating the output, which most people are focused on now when they, uh, I mean, the generative so-called so creative systems. Uh, that is a bit difficult. Um, but there are, of course, lots of possibilities uh, with AI algorithms in art, and I'm sure there, this is like, I wrote this classification like two years ago, I'm sure it has changed quite a bit, but I'm trying to update things. Uh, uh, most AI systems are black boxes. They're batch uh, processes that generate lots of material. We see sometimes you can speed up this so it becomes almost uh, uh, real time, but not quite. Some of them are interactive on the next level, and the, the final level is when they are autonomous and they actually take decisions about you know what to do and when to play and etc. Things like that. As I see it, the most uh, interesting aspect of algorithms is to explore what is possible to do. You know, I can do things with certain algorithms that I can't do by myself. Structured searches of the space of the possible. In the same way as before, but more efficient and different spaces, different parameter spaces, which can give me new artistic expressions with similar amount of effort, but different music or different art. We can reach new remote corners in the solution spaces than we could reach without these tools. And in time-based art, we also can have new trajectories in these parameter spaces, uh, which can lead to completely new expressions too. A primary, qu primary quality of AI systems is that they let us work on new abstraction levels before it may have been um, to, to say, okay, copy-paste these notes from here, there to there, that kind of thing. Now it's like generate something that sounds like this, or filter this audio so that it sounds has the same kind of general sound as this music, that kind of thing. So we can speak by examples, we can speak in terms of styles and patterns and behaviors, um, 
And they also allow us to think in terms of systems that I play with an algorithm or inside an algorithm even. I have a big research project called Systemic Improvisation where the humans are part of the, uh, an improvising system. And we can think in potentials. We can think, oh, I want to generate pieces that have these kinds of gestures or these kind of tonalities, etc., and then explore that and, and in a kind of a gardening paradigm. Uh, with, where you sow things and then harvest. I, I'll get back to that uh, later. And these new abstraction levels also lead to new crafts. I spend the same effort as before, but on a higher abstraction level. Require, that requires new understanding, new, practice, uh, new practices and new skills. And for some, I mean the kids today, they don't hand code their own algorithms. They, they use libraries or even plugins. They have no idea how they work underneath. But they will learn a new craft of like uh, how to design a good training set, etc. By, by doing it, which is a new task that nobody had the, uh, had the possibility of learning before. So we also have to understand that, yeah, they don't code their own algorithms, but they learn other things. Of course, these algorithms are interesting in themselves for geeks and as uh, you know, a medium for expression. They also allow us to uh, work with much more complex material than before because we, we can basically deal with a whole symphony as an object or a, a snippet of video or something that, that is generated where before we, we were maybe generating a line structure and then it was hand converted into a video or something like that. And also new tools create new kinds of references because you can now say that this piece is similar to that piece because they were using the same kind of uh, model so they have the same sound or, or uh, same kind of structures generated from the same algorithms, it, which is a sort of a semantic reference or syntactic reference even that didn't exist before so that can create new kinds of music theory actually. Agency is a big topic that has its own branch, a little further here, and it's really important. So, um, because it sort of controls how we talk about things. Who, I realize I say this before I define agency, but basically, you know, who did this? Um, the machine did it. Computers can paint like Van Gogh. Well, can they? Were there no humans that pressed the button and fed it certain selected Van Gogh pictures, etc.? Probably, yes. Um, but perceived agency is controlling a lot about uh, our discussion about AI. And I think this is a real problem because it, it uh, affects our expectations, it affects uh, policy and politics of AI and ethics. It's a PR problem for AI also. If people have the weird, weird and wrong uh, opinions or, or impressions of what is actually going on. Uh, so I'm a bit troubled by that actually. But it's very hard to get your voice heard. <laughs> now, uh, if we go to agency and talk about it a little bit more. So agency in a stronger meaning is the capacity to act or the, the capacity to influence or cause an effect. So I choose to go and buy a beer. You know, I have the agency to do that. Nobody's stopping me. But if I'm locked in, in prison or something, I, I can't do that. So I don't have the same kind of agency as I have when I'm free. Uh, there are lots of theories, for example, Bruno Latour, that also ascribe agency to objects. What difference does this object make, sort of, in a process? Uh, so, uh, what change does it make? Uh, and, and in that sense, you can say that the object has an embedded agency from before, from the person designing it, etc. I, I prefer to try to trace that agency back. While uh, he's not always interested in that, he sort of as assigns it to that, to that object uh, as it is. Uh, I prefer, I can't compete with Bruno Latour, but in my own uh, theories of agency, I talk about influential agency, the influence of an object, and then you can trace how was, was that influence influenced by, by people before that. Uh, it's, very, it's very similar, though. Uh, and let me see how detailed I should go about this. So, well, you can, th you can try to analyze these things by, tr by looking at an actual creative process. And I sometimes do this with my students. I make them do a little sound work. And then afterwards I reveal, yeah, now you did this little composition. 
uh, and I asked you to document your process. Now look at what happened. Which tools did you, did you use? Um, how did that process look? And understand that process in greater detail. And then also hypothetically ask, so if you change the tool, what would happen then? If it was another person, what would happen then, etc. So, so uh, there are various ways. We can't really measure this, but we can discuss about it. And I'm, I'm quite sure that it actually is there. And this influence from, for example, tools, etc. Uh, and tools can be really complex stuff these days. Brings a meaning, references to the work. Uh, it, uh, it can be bring references to other music composed with similar tools or that has similar structure. Uh, it imprints traces of the process to the work. Um, and there are other things, parameter choices. There are, there's so many steps where things have an influence on how it actually goes. Um, and agency can be by proxy through tools, for example. Um, you see here. Um, yes, for example, um, I'm not entirely sure how to frame this. In some cases, agency is very hard to trace. So, for example, when you have emergent systems that are, are based on very small parts that interact, typical a society of ants. An ant is very simple, but the society of ants is very complex, where the overall behavior depends on the design of the small parts, but it's impossible to really trace how. Um, but it makes a qualitative difference, for example. Um, Toolmakers have an influence, agency by proxy, I'm, I'm quite convinced, because they embed so much aesthetic choices in their instruments, in the tools that they make. Uh, there's there's uh, hundreds of years of understanding of sort of the spiraling process of instrument makers and instrument users and their interactions to develop new, new um, tools. The, the uh, agency by proxy, this influence, can go way back. For example, in my algorithms, uh, where I use evolutionary computation. Of course, evolutionary computation goes back to Darwin, but he didn't think of it in that term. He was trying to understand nature. Uh, but he has some <laughs> unconscious influential agency in how my evolutionary composition systems, systems work, because I did indeed study his theories and uh, lots of uh, other evolutionary theory, of course. Um, you can also think of this in terms of information. And I'm tending to do that more and more. There's, uh, you know, the science of information theory, um, where you can look at the amount of interactions, the amount of information during the creative process, uh, and see that it might be considered to be proportional of this influential agency. Um, it can certainly vary in magnitude. Uh, and we can also see that if there is a tool where you just press play, you have a home keyboard and you just press play and it does a perfect orchestral accompaniment of whatever twinkle twinkle little star melody you play, you can see the proportions. Yeah, I pressed one button or two buttons. That's not many bits of information. But the people who designed the tool put in megabytes of information. So it actually also uh, is... Uh, meaningful to think of it in an information theory um, perspective. So, um, influential agency of humans, um, you can go into free will here, but I won't. But I mean, we, we are very aware of the idea of authorship through creative process, all the decisions we make, the toolmaker I already mentioned, but it's a little bit harder. Uh, with algorithms, and I mentioned already emergence, some algorithms, it's really hard to uh, tell when things come from an algorithm or where in the algorithm it comes from. Uh, there are also lots of non-deterministic processes. You may involve chance and things happen by themselves, etc. It's, it's really hard to trace th these influences. Um, and also over time, when you use a system for that does computation for a very long time, like a large simulation, etc. Uh, or maybe a system that learns that interacts with lots of humans over time, it's, it's harder and harder to trace where these influences came. 
So we start to think that, yeah, this system itself has this agency, but actually it may come from humans. Like like a huge language model, for example, like ChatGPT or something. I mean, all that language comes from, from humans. Um, so there's lots of human agency, but it's impossible to trace. But we should be aware, and we, if we think of one of these typical cases, like, you know, generating... Um, generating a Van Gogh painting or something like that. There were humans that invented a general algorithm inspired by nature. Neural net networks and, and deep learning, you know, is inspired by how our brain cells work. Uh, evolutionary computation is inspired by how evolution in nature works. There were humans that programmed a particular implementation of this algorithm as a library, which is still like a universal implementation. Then some human ch chose which algorithm to use, chose uh, which library and specific uh, part of that to use, and chose how the material to be generated should be represented, Sh how should these images be represented in, the, in this algorithm, like how do we parameterize the uh, images or the sound or whatever. We set a large number of parameters for running the algorithm. We choose training sets, if, if it's a machine learning algorithm. We tweak the parameters based on failed <laughs> runs of this algorithm. We always run many times and that never works the first time. And we cherry pick from large sets of results. And this is the process behind, you know, the computer can pa paint like Van Gogh. I mean, somewhere in here, there is a filter that's used something called style transfer that analyzes the statistical properties of a Van Gogh painting and applies them to a photo from my holiday on, on Ibiza. And, and, you know, and, and that is created through all this chain of human um, decisions. And we say the computer can paint like Van Gogh. And I think that no, that's not what happened. Not at all. I will skip that particular case, which just was about one of my AI composition systems from 20 years ago. Um, another interesting aspect, where is the agency in the code? I mean, all these systems are computer code. Um, because a, a deep learning model is just a huge matrix of weights of neurons connected to each other. It doesn't have any agency in itself. There's somewhere a loop that says, okay, evaluate this image with this machine learning algorithm. What is the outcome? If it's good enough, show it. I'm simplifying a lot now. But that kind of loop, the agency, the, the actual actions happen in that loop. The machine learning algorithm is just a, a function that is sometimes used to evaluate things or to classify things. So the AI, um, the agency is actually in, is in the normal code, which is not really considered AI, just typical programming, if, then, loop things, etc. cetera. Uh, and we need to understand that because those are often very simple, hard decisions. AlphaGo, for example, you know, the, play, the beats the world champion in the, in the uh, uh, Asian game of Go. It's a loop that evaluates what has been done until now and what's the next, what's the best move soon. And of course, it's more complex than that. But the actual machine learning model is just asked questions at various points. So to understand uh, even further this kind of shift of, of agency from us to, to the tools, we can look at, uh, well, these are actually two representations of the same thing. This is from a book. Uh, this is like the mind map with some more information. So, so basically, um, we have the tool designer who sort of invented a certain tool, then the tool maker who makes a specific tool, then we have the actual tool that has this embedded agency, then we have the tool user, usually the artist, uh, that makes an artwork, and there's the receiver listener, and, and uh, sort of a chain of influence going on here. And of course, there are lots of feedback processes here, personal history, art history, etc. Uh, and there's a similar spectrum of, once again, this is sort of the same image, uh, of tool complexities. Uh, in earlier times, tools were like a paintbrush or a violin. It's still, I would still consider a rather simple tool. Um, physical tools, theoretical tools, like a harm, theory of harmony, something like that. 
But nowadays we, we start to work with rule sets or template based tools that have databases of, you know, PowerPoint has templates to do fancy, fancy slides sets um, from presets. Synths come with presets, uh, etc. I call those template based tools. They bring ready made material they have built in databases. Then we have generative tools and algorithms. And then we have autonomous tools. And I don't know if, even if they are tools at that point. Uh, and, and what we're talking about is mostly here now, but actually we are, I would say that a pre-trained model is also maybe a template based tool, which has this wonderful quality of helping you to create results that sound exactly the same as the other user who used the same tool. So it's a risk there, the conforming power of template based tools. Um, and we can do a similar spectrum of, of different complexity of systems that have generative properties. Um, this one is interesting. So tools are more and more complex. And we think, or some people think, we can use less and less time to use these tools. And that's a dangerous assumption. So we can look at some cases. If I use a simple tool, oops, sorry. I have this weird setting that it centers it all the time. A simple tool with little effort. Let's say, okay, I take the violin and I don't spend much time. <laughs> it will sound terrible. Uh, I won't get very far or, or maybe, you know, a, a pencil uh, and I try to draw something. I will get trivial results in a way. The tool doesn't carry so much complexity and, and so much influential agency and I, I'm not the, the amount of information that I put into the, this process is quite small. If you look at the, the next step, a simple tool but a large effort. I, I apply applying skills from years of training, so I spent a lot of effort there. Um, and maybe a lot of time using the tool. Then the main part of the influential agency will be from me as an artist, not from the tool maker. Uh, of course, my training indirectly comes from others. There we have influential agency from my teachers, uh, which is not to be neglected, and other people I learned from. But very little comes from the tool. And then the next case, complex tool with little effort and interaction. So we have a complex tool now, but I don't spend much time with it. So maybe a tool that contains presets and generative algorithms. The main part of the influential agency will be from the tool maker here because I'm not inputting so much information in the process. I, reply, I rely on the ready-made material and the material generated from the algorithms with default parameters because I haven't even bothered to change them. Then we can go to some more uh, non-obvious cases. So a complex tool of my own design, because a lot of electronic artists create their own tools, but I use it with little effort meaning I spent a lot of time developing my tool and then I do a quick hack for this concert or something like that. So a little inflow of information in the, in the current situation, the main influence is from the tool maker, but that's me, so it's not so problematic. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what I meant with this, but uh, uh, yeah, if I do this over time, with little effort, sort of it, my influence is diluted as the output grows because I'm actually not really inputting much and, and things get more and more similar. If I use a complex tool made by somebody else, but I put in a large effort. And this is the most interesting case, I think. So the to tool maker is somebody else. Maybe Anders here has spent lots and lots of time designing a, a composition system that he has then published as an open source tool for others to use, or maybe he sells it as a, as a, as a product. Then I use that system, but I spend a lot of time with lots of interactions trying to find the remote corners of the solution space, which nobody else has found, or somebody else who spends a lot of time, they probably end up in another corner or you know, there are many corners in high dimensional spaces. Thank you. That's a very good property. <laughs> so there's uh, initially a large influence from the tool maker, but during the process, the tool user's influence becomes prominent. 
So I, I expect to spend the same t amount of time as when I was composing by hand. Uh, so I spent two months doing this piece, but I spent that time learning his system and learning the quirks of it and how to abuse it and how to do it in my way. And it will be my piece anyway, because I input a lot of information. But thanks to the information from the tool, I could get much further than I would have come otherwise. So that is, I think, uh, maybe the most interesting and uh, sort of a good case. We have a concept which is sort of crucial, but very hard to deal with, it's called creative agency, and was uh, defined by uh, Ollie Bown and John McCormack in a paper from 2011. Sort of the, the actual creative contribution attributable to the actual system. What is the novelty and value that cannot be attributed to um uh, to any other uh, like to the user or anything and that they think is the important property of a system but it's very hard to find uh, and to define this how do, uh, there are lots of questions that could help us when do we take our hands off the system and it sort of starts to create o o on itself uh, what rem remains of a design over time does the solution space change over time? Will it change after I start a system, for, for, for example? Um, what are the aesthetic constraints of the representation? Uh, and are these changing over time as the, as the system takes off? Um, is the system it lives in, the result, is actually also evolving? So can, it change, can there be major changes over time? And once again, is there sufficient inflow of information uh, from interaction with other agents and other parts of the environment? So uh, we can't go into super detail about that, but, but um, let me see here. You see, I come to the same things all the time, emphasizing that to, to allow these things to happen, we need to have a creative process, which I think is the main thing lacking in, in current systems. Uh, but that is also true for the algorithms. They should need to be designed uh, as processes that have interactions with things outside and inside them. And uh, actually it's quite interesting also to think about some things that are, are really crucial for us that are creating problems with AI systems, like forgetting, which is a way of filtering. Uh, each also forgetting over generations. A newborn human restarts and has to learn everything from scratch an AI model can be kept and just accumulate stuff. Um, so each human reacquire agency and, and does it in a unique way. So we are all different, right? Uh, and we gradually forget, filter memories, reinterpret things, etc. cetera. Um, this is also important in AI, but it's actually not really handled well. Um, uh, deep learning networks do not handle well if you train them with new stuff suddenly on top of other stuff. Uh, there are weird things that can happen. Uh, so there is research going into forgetting uh, in these kind of systems. Uh, so so that there are so many interesting aspects that we need to take into account for, for these systems to become uh, creative and interesting uh, in a deeper way than they are. Okay, so there are a few... Um, core problems with these kind of generative systems from a creative uh, point of view. These ones were, were uh, published in a, a paper I wrote uh, like five-ish years ago. Um, and the most important, I would say, is the inherent non-creativity of machine learning, as it is. It's actually designed to give you the most likely outcome. How does that sound to an artist? Not exactly what you're trained to do. Um, it converges sort of to the mean. We can call them mean machines if we're a little bit nasty. Instead of diverging, uh, they stay inside the box by definition unless they actually don't function properly. Uh, and we can illustrate this in a very simple way because I often get asked, okay, so uh, yeah, can we compose Beethoven's 10th symphony. I think there was a project about that recently. And people have been doing this, this for a long time. Oh, let's do more Mozart sonatas. So the, I can illustrate the problem. And this argument I published 22 years ago, so, but it still holds, I think. 
if let's look at uh, something, let's say Beethoven's Beethoven's 32 piano sonatas, and then we want to make a 33rd. The first sonata has these ideas, like this um, metaphorical illustration, a set of ideas inside this little curve here. The, the second sonata has these ideas. They overlap a little bit because they're both sonatas and there's a style, there's Wiener classicism style and they, a sonata has a certain form. So you just continue to sort of Im, do an inventory of all the ideas, the, all the material that are in all these sonatas. And when you've done all of them, here's the circle of all the ideas. And then you train an AI system on this and you ger generate a new sonata. And it will be somewhere inside this circle because this is all it knows. But if Beethoven did his 33rd piano sonata, if he lived a little longer, if he didn't get death uh, or whatever, he would do the 33rd and he would, just like all the others, go outside of the circle and make it a little larger because every sonata contains something that wasn't in any of the others. But the AI can't do that. To be able to do that, it would have to emulate his life his pr longer processes, what influenced him over time, uh, and that's beyond what is possible. And also even emulate how those actions in his life, those happenings, whatever, uh, affected his musical output. So we're still on, you know, emulating the symptoms of the creativity and not the processes behind. So um, that's why this kind of mimetic AI simply doesn't work. But of course you can use these systems in interesting ways anyway. Uh, you can alter the weights, you can randomly alter the weights or, or do all kinds of weirdness to those underlying matrices. You can combine uh, probability sets or, or tra different training sets together, train it on, you know, like Indian ragas and, and heavy metal and see what happens, you know, just as an example. Uh, exploit untrained corners of a parameter space by by pushing the input that sort of triggers the output and, and try to, you know, undertrain networks. There are so many different uh, ways to abuse these systems, but to use them to just create more of the same is completely uh, non-creative. And if what comes out actually is novel, usually it depends on that the algorithm was faulty. <laughs> and that's interesting in itself. I see I need to uh, think a little bit more. There are so many things here. Yes. Um, well, another problem is we only get answers to the questions we ask. So when you design these systems, you already have so many assumptions about what music is or what images are, or what language is used to, used for, etc. So, so um, that's the problem about these systems. There's a lot of data filtering going on uh, in what they're trained on. Um, or, uh, let me see. What else? You know, actually, I'm, I'm on the wrong one. I should go here to the next main one. This is a known problem in AI. So the, the solutions we get, the kind of trained models that we get, they're very opaque. We can't say, oh, this is the part of the code that does this, and this does this, and this is the one that does the little trillo in the flute part. It doesn't work like that. So, um, and it's a whole research topic called explainable AI. We get results that work, systems that work, but we don't get much knowledge. Um, and it makes it also super difficult, oops, yeah, let's not go too deeply here, to, very difficult to edit what we get out because we don't really know its underlying logic. So we get stuff that we can use, but we have to spend a lot of time to sort of assimilate its qualities and its structures, etc. cetera. Um, so that is a problem. Also, uh, I already said, black box processes with lack of inf interaction, lack of inter information flowing in and out. Actually, uh, computer electronic music was much faster in the 60s when we had analog synths because they're super fast. Now we have these big AI systems and there's lots of latency. Um, so which one is most important? Um, well, the, they lack a model of the outside world, so they don't understand what they do. Uh, and uh, they they have a very shallow representation of what the the output is. That it's just numbers to these models, of course. So um, and let me see here. Yeah, no, I already said that. And this is an interesting problem, and it's a whole lecture in itself. Um, 
if you take like this Mid Journey or, or Dali or or, or, or these uh, image generating systems or ChatGPT, they harvest like the whole internet and then they generate lots of stuff. And they actually contribute to dilute the internet because they generate so much stuff. And this stuff is embedded into people's texts, students' essays. Yes, it happens all the time. Uh, journal articles, etc. And it's super hard to identify when it actually comes from there. People try, but it doesn't really work. Which means that they will harvest new stuff uh, and gradually they will be diluted, these systems. And each algorithm always has artifacts and is always filtering. So you can argue, this is a paper I'm writing. I actually published, uh, I held a lecture about this in 2022 and it's now super urgent, I think. You can reason about what kind of properties of the algorithms will actually be more and more evident. And, and if you know your contemporary music history, if you think about Alvin Lucier's I Am Sitting in a Room, it's a very sim similar process. The resonances of the rooms with complete uh, 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 continuous feedback process, suddenly uh, after like 30 generations, you only hear those resonances and the original data is not there anymore. We will have similar resonances from algorithms, from their artifacts, from their characteristic misunderstandings or, or generative properties. So that's a, a, a new one, so to speak. Um, well, there is so much here. Um, let me see, maybe a little bit of the aesthetic stuff. Um, let me see here. If we generate with AI, is it meaningful to um, think of it as if it's made by a human? I is that important? Or uh, do we like think lowly of stuff made by a machine? I mean, should we have, a, have that kind of delusion that is made by human? Is that important? I very often hear people talk about the, like artistic Turing tests. Like, I play this. Uh, can I play this piece of generated music and see if people are fooled by and think it's composed by a, a human? And people actually do this kind of research. But if you read Alan Turing's original article about the Turing test, which was about you know chatting with an agent that you don't see through a text interface and finding out if that has consciousness. Um, it's all about interaction. So just listening to one piece of music is completely ridiculous because you don't know if that software is capable of making more. If you, pr if you press run again on that algorithm, it makes the same piece of music because it may be just hard-coded into the code. But if it can have this believable variation over time that I talked about in the very beginning, over a really long time and actually develops, then um, maybe it should be able to pass this kind of Turing test. So it's all about interaction. Um, well, this was partly what I already said. There's so much here. Um, <laughs> this is a long, long lecture, uh, but I compress it a little bit. Oh, this one is interesting. I have this term called characteristic inability, which applies to both humans and algorithms. So uh, the way in which Björk, for example, is a prominent musical artist, the way in which she doesn't sing perfectly, the way in which she will not follow perfectly a notated melody, but she does it in her very special way, that's her quality. That's her characteristic inability. The way in which an algorithm doesn't render something super realistic, but it actually has some kind of awkwardness that's very often considered the quality. It's, it's the style of that algorithm. So the way in which I cannot play Beethoven exactly as it says on the score, uh, because of my uh, limitations, the size of my hands, the amount of training, and the way I think about rhythmic structures or whatever, my characteristic inability to do the perfect thing is the quality of my Beethoven playing, if there ever was such a thing. Yes, I have played a lot of Beethoven, but you know, just as an example. So, so I think that is sort of, we have to realize that the, the limitations of these algorithms is what make them interesting. So, even machine learning systems can be really appear to be creative. Uh, they try to do a perfect image of something, but the way they fail is actually why we like it. It's quite a, a, a common situation. Um, doo -doo -doo. Yeah, there are. Oh, I want to say a little bit more about gardening paradigm. Um, so when we work with these kind of algorithms, we off very often end up in not 
saying this node should be here, this node should be here. More like setting up a system that gives us a set of results and we choose among those results so we interact with the system and create stuff. Uh, so we sort of define a space to be explored uh, and also like a topology within that space, what is close to each other and if I take one step, where do, where do I go, etc. We define borders and potentials of the solution space and then we explore that space. Um, and uh, but there are also problems with that uh, analogy, but I think it's, it's very strong and very interesting. But there can also be problems, for example, um, that the actual exploration process very easily becomes the form of the actual work. Uh, and, you know, it's more of an interactive experience and maybe that is the quality of the work and not how it sounds. So it becomes like an interactive artwork instead. So I will now jump to conclusions uh, because a lot of the things I just skipped. Well, actually, this one is really important <laughs> because it's part of the conclusions. So are skills no longer needed? Well, they're definitely needed uh, to understand the tools, to, to also to be able to evaluate results from the tools. But there are also lots of new skills as I did mention earlier, meta skills and skills about, you know, how to use these systems uh, that will be developed. Uh, and if we go here, can anyone, everyone do this? Con connecting to the kind of tool agency that I talked about before, you can answer no or yes. No, there is no free lunch. With little effort spent, little input information flow, you will get fast results, but they will be very unpersonal. Agen your agency will be insignificant. But you can also answer yes. With open-ended interactive generative systems, anybody with aesthetic judgment can spend enough time to breed, grow, generate characteristic and personal material and get interesting results. Not more efficient, but different, and your agency will be significant. So there are two answers to that question. And um, there are so many different answers here, but I, I think I will just go to this one because I think this is also a very important uh, aspect. Um, you think not in terms of artifacts. This relates also to our discussions earlier about the copyright, authorship, etc. Art is maybe not a thing or an artifact anymore, and I'm saying that next to an art fair full of art art effects. Um, it's something you do. There's this term musicking by the musicologist Christopher Small. There's a book with that name. Uh, and he, it's an artistic activity and that's what counts. If you do that, then it becomes much easier to understand and, and it's not so problematic. Yeah, yeah, I can interact with humans. I can interact with AI systems. It's already happening. We can create together with them uh, and all involved agents share influential agency authorship. I don't know about the royalty, I leave that to the lawyers. We had some comments about that earlier. Uh, and uh, I think that is a, a very crucial aspect. So I just leave these conclusions here uh, and you can look at them while I take that one minute question that we have time for, thank you. Yes, one minute question or one question. <laughs> Any questions? Well, this is not a question in itself because I think you had so much that you ans already answered all the questions I really had. But one comment is going back to your definition of human art or can we leave out the human? Um, if we think about uh, the the problem of dilution and also the artifacts. If we, let's say the training set is always based on some kind of human output, let's let's put uh, the um, the paintings uh, as Van Gogh as an as a, um, as a model. At some point, if an AI learns use a new training set only based on uh, the output from the AIs in an iterative way, let's say in, in like 20 iterations. Um, 
so it dilutes itself itself what is is it still any human agency left or is it any what do you think about it can we then speak with as art because we are the ones that define it as art but what could it be then no two two different questions yeah the human influence is one step removed at least the influence that sneaked in through the training set is one step removed if you sort of filter it through one generation of generative uh, stuff. The thing, if it's still human art, there is uh, the human measure is uh, in this uh, aesthetics here, super, which is a super important thing that I forgot to say here. All algorithms are made with us as a measure. They're made for our uh, perception, our bandwidth, uh, and to be received by humans. Uh, even if it's machine generated. If you take out the human from the loop as a sender or a receiver, will it completely lose its relevance, right? Will it become ungraspable? Uh, you can compare that to, to scientific instruments that translate, you know, like very large or very small things or entities that we can't see, like radiation or whatever, to the scale, human scale. It's an image I can see that my eyes can perceive in the wavelength that my eyes and my ears work with, etc. That's what scientific instruments do. Um, so if, if we remove the human from the loop, there have been experiments, you know, evolving uh, both composers and listeners, you know, it either goes to playing one note per year <laughs> or 50,000 notes per second. It's outside of what we can deal with. And it's not, I mean, they make, they make music for themselves then, right? You have, you have a little discussion about that here. So, um, yes, and it becomes sort of like an interspecies art. Do we make music for cats? No, not really. You know, because we have no idea how they perceive it and, and, or for, for fruit flies or something. You know, we don't know what, what's their bandwidth. Uh, we do it for ourselves and and if the algorithms would diverge from us in a future where they are autonomous why would they even bother with us as, as long as we force them to make music for us they're not actually autonomous i think there's an argument about that somewhere here uh, yeah there's i think there's another branch cross species art that takes this even further into uh, uh, more um, hypothetical reasoning uh, and I'll stop there but there is uh, these two papers contain most of what I said um, if you want to read further thank you Pale beautiful thank you <laughs> okay and now we will probably present like a you know, a case study for what you have just said <laughs> to continue this uh, discussion about uh, human and machine interaction um, and art um, and what is generated, what is the agency and how the process goes. So like we, we will look into this particular example and then we will have some uh, more little dis discussions and questions. I would like to invite my colleagues uh, Rimas and Gilvinas. Uh, here on the stage, we just recently had this exercise of um, creating an artwork uh, in, let's say, based on uh, tradition, based on uh, uh, like this idea of uh, having uh, 17th century opera reimagined. Uh, with the help of, of the uh, transformer model uh, of the AI, uh, something similar to ChatGPT. And we will talk a little bit about the process, um, how, how it worked uh, in, from our own perspectives. And then, yeah, well, it would be interesting also to discuss with you what <laughs> do you think about it. Um, so... Let's start. Well, I think we can all have our own microphones. <laughs> Super. Hello. So everything started from an idea that maybe the um, um, 
uh, AI models are already there to kind of uh, simulate a certain musical style. When it was done with algorithms, uh, it, 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 it was successful in some cases and some extents. However, especially with the um, trainable models, uh, it's quite logical that they can simulate or replicate the style. And uh, several years ago, we had a discussion with uh, Vitotas Gilavich, who's a producer uh, from... Uh, from um, uh, National Museum of Duke's Palace, as well as uh, opera, that maybe we could, you know, try to see if we can use the libretto, which survived from 17th century of the operas, which were staged there in Vilnius. However, music, unfortunately, did not survive. We kind of know, probably, uh, the composer, Marco Skaki. Not a lot of his music survived, but, but still. Also, as we know, that in 17th century, unfortunately, probably, um, it's hard to estimate, but maybe just 20 or 30 percent of music uh, reached us from that time. We we know about 10 or 11 Monteverdi operas, for example, and we have uh, scores just of three of them which reached our time. So we can say that probably there have been some more uh, operas which don't even know about. And then we took the libretto, and then you know what happened then. Uh, <coughs> Yes, libretto. Yeah, actually, because our team was quite small, I took over like two jobs in two completely different uh, phases of the development of uh, this opera. And the first stage, uh, even before the music was composed, was to work with the only element in of this historic opera that has survived to this day, this libretto of Andromeda written in uh, 1644 by Italian poet, musician, and diplomat uh, Virgilio Puccitelli, and uh, a priest in, in his young age. And it's quite... Uh, I started from the biography of this Virgilio Puccitelli, and who became like a priest in his youth and worked in the Rome, came uh, to the state of the Poland and Lithuanian uh, at the end of the rule of Zygmunt as uh, free. And uh, then, actually, he became like a secretary for Italian matters and uh, was sent back to Italy, to Venice and to Rome, uh, where he was searching for Italian singers to participate in the drama and opera theater built in Vilnius uh, Lower Castle. So actually, this opera could be written to particular uh, voices, to these particular uh, singers that he found in Italy. Um, and um, writing music for for the entire original libretto uh, would mean that we will we will create uh, four, five or six uh, hour long opera. Uh, so our first task, uh, rather than trying to recreate, again, uh, most of the people think that we try to recreate original historical uh, opera, but. Um, rather than trying to recreate the historical opera, uh, we was trying to adapt it to the present day and to, to shorten it uh, by keeping the, the main characteristics of early opera dramaturgy. So I made uh, a synopsis like of the plot of the opera and divided the existing text into the three segments. Uh, the one that must be kept, the one uh, that is possible possibly unnecessary. I hope uh, Virgilio doesn't hear me right now. And the third segment, uh, the text that needs uh, to be reduced depending on the musical form. So uh, this means, uh, this means uh, that while in dramatic theater we could uh, choose like a strong compression or on, of time or a linear fragmentation of the action, a fragmentation that speeds up the plot very much or even leave just a few lines out of the scene. Um, but the specificity of opera does not allow us to deal with uh, the text in such a free way and I can't do it by myself. Uh, because what with uh, a recitative which with only three lines sounds like. <laughs> so we needed to agree on shortened sections where the montage of the text would determine uh, the final music score. Uh, those was criteria used uh, to shorten the libretto where 
the dramaturgy of the text, uh, the rhythmicity of the text, the timing of the text meanings, allowing the musical number to have its own meaningful, meaningful climaxes, rather than just uh, a very intense, quick plot which constantly offers something new. So uh, this initial montage of the text became like the starting point for the composition of the music which also means a new form of the opera, because it means perhaps a picture that had previous, previously, in original, been somewhere in the middle and was un, un, unremarkable. In the new version, could move to the, for example, middle of the second half and become climactic. climactic. So we changed the dramaturgy and the, uh, maybe uh, even um, how how, impo how important is this particular scene. And when I give the shortened version and the text uh, of the shortening recommendations to Mantotas, uh, as I am giving the microphone right now. <laughs> yes, I have my own microphone. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, uh, what we did also, like, um, you know, when you deal with music, you deal with form. Uh, and when we had these scenes more or less defined, which we keep, uh, we also looked in what part of text which can be shortened is more interesting in a way because the text is the only thing what was left. You could try to even grasp what kind of rhythmic was uh, there, what kind of musical forms were used for one or another piece. However, it's something which machine can't really define, right? I mean, uh, the the uh, generation of long form uh, of, of, let's say, of musical or uh, textual or, or film, for example, there are not even uh, like fully functioning models for that, which would try to generate film, for example. Uh, it's 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 a, it's a big problem, and still, like, it, we had to define. Uh, you know, what to fill in, <laughs> so to say. So we had to define the form of the opera, which was based on, on, on work done by Gildenas. Also we had, uh, and basically I had to define the form of each musical piece, uh, which was there, based on the text and trying to keep the balance within time. Uh, like, okay, this piece should be longer, also, if, if there is text is too long, maybe I can still take out some of the uh, some of the um, uh, some of it, uh, which is not like essential for the for the development of the drama as well. Because anyway, it's it's also a dramatic piece. It has to have sense. It has to be balanced. It has to have story, uh, beginning, middle, and the end. You know, <laughs> and. Um, and then we, we did this uh, preliminary division as well as preliminary selection of text. Um, of course, the, the, we wanted to keep it in Italian. And that gave me already something mm, to work with. Now, uh, shortly, we talked about it a little bit on the first day. However, uh, I used the transform transformer model uh, developed by Martin Malandro was giving a presentation of it uh, on, on Thursday evening. Mm, so it was probably, um, how to say, uh, according to your classification, <laughs> probably that case where there was a complex tool, uh, which I used uh, like uh, in a complex way <laughs> or spent like really a lot of time seeing how I can adapt it to my purposes. First of all, I had to fine tune it uh, with existing material of the rem which remained uh, from the composer. Uh, that was uh, also like, um, let's say, uh, it was not enough uh, because uh, most of what was left was his like uh, choral pieces, which were more related to sacred music and opera is not really a sacred music usually composers in those times did uh, slightly different things when, when working for church and when working for kings and uh, making something for their pleasure right uh, so that meant that also i had to uh, include other composers uh, which were <laughs> had their work surviving until our times 
uh, including uh, Monteverdi, for example, also some some songs of uh, other uh, composers, uh, to fine tune the model so that it would increase the probability that it will generate something. Although it was trained mainly on uh, classical music, let's say that it would increase the probability that I had the stylistically correct results. Uh, of course, we tried to recreate the sense of the style you know, of this opera, but. Uh, on the other hand, when I think about my agency, the, the, the most interesting part for me was maybe uh, creating still something which is also thing created in our times. <laughs> so first of all, the AI use mm, is kind of uh, ensures that. <laughs> uh, another thing is that still these discrepancies or these weird things you get sometimes <laughs> from 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 the machine is probably the mon most interesting thing for me but uh, anyway I, I wouldn't call it like a completely mm, uh, let's say authentic recreation of a style uh, what is the most interesting for me from uh, from the musical sense was that uh, it's a stylized work which keeps the sense and the feeling and I don't know the smell of 17th century opera However, that uh, between the lines, you can still feel and hear that it, it was created in our times. Uh, and that I would know exactly where these weird things are and if they are kept in the score that, uh, that, that you know, like when, when you have a problem, you try to kind of artistically um, adapt it, that it's not a con, <laughs> but a pro <laughs> in a way. Uh, now the work further after the fine tuning uh, was actually working on each piece uh, generating basically opera measure by measure and what was even more important than fine tuning was actually prompting the model. Uh, uh, this model you can uh, because it's continuation model and it's actually pretty good uh, on infilling so for example if I would need just if I would have a original bass line surviving uh, and melody line surviving, uh, probably uh, the result would have been much more authentic. However, here we have nothing. We just have the sense of rhythm from text and uh, the structure we created, basically. And then I, by analyzing other operas, uh, okay, so this is the first uh, like introduction, okay, it can be something like Battaglia, okay, now there is, of course, the Ritornello thing, then we have um, uh, recitativos and arias um, and things like that. Uh, but like for each this piece which we defined, uh, I, I tried to prompt the model first of all, uh, and it was all in music. <laughs> I found the way that the best way to prompt it is to actually create like uh, musical prompts which might make no sense as music itself. However, it would uh, help me to generate first or two first measures. <laughs> so let's say I take, uh, I need to generate intro for example. So. I take intros of the early Baroque operas I like or I think would fit the sense of, uh, uh, let's say, well, emotion, let's say, or, or state, uh, the mood <laughs> I would imagine I would need for that piece and create some kind of a stitch from it, like a Frankenstein, you know, like something from this intro, something from that intro. Also write in myself the rhythmical sense, which, which would be there, which would be like a rhythm, uh, as well as uh, rhythmization, maybe that's the correct word, as well as uh, adding um, uh, definitions of uh, like is it from three or is it from four and of course some prompts uh, because as I said there is a huge problem with uh, creating the form so even the smaller form like ABA right I mean you uh, generate the ritornello <laughs> separately, then you generate the part which is more like recitativo separately, then you generate something which is more aria-like separately, and you prompt each of these parts with uh, uh, related but different material. And uh, because of uh, the fact that if you want to create something, let's say, uh, uh, which if you want to create something interesting, let's say, which might have been <laughs> composed then, or maybe not necessarily in this reality, maybe in some kind of parallel reality. You, you keep on trying until your ear, my musical intuition, my decision evaluates that it is the thing which I think 
would fit there because of the entropy or the uh, chaos you can introduce to the model uh, with the parameter of temperature uh, that's also quite unpredictable <laughs> so sometimes you can get what you want uh, I don't know, maybe after 12 tries, sometimes maybe you need a 50 tries. <laughs> However, if w whenever you decide that, okay, this is what I need, I'll say first few measures, then I can kind of continue, or continue easier, uh, like uh, forgetting the prompts, let's say, and, and, and continuing in filling from what I already have. So this is basically how how it happened. I I, I put in some uh, some screenshots, let's say, of of the of the Reaper uh, MIDI data, where you can see that okay, this is uh, like a, uh, my my messy project. How I generated uh, intro bit by bit and different prompts I tried. Uh, this this is like for example for a recitativo line. And this is for instrumental battaglia scene. Uh, like here you can maybe more or less clearly see there are at the beginning like these uh, four sets of boxes which are four different prompts I tried and on the right you can see like the results, the, <laughs> the measures which have been generated in. Uh, by the way, uh, the responsiveness of model to have this conversation with the machine, you also have to have at least, uh, um, I would say, um, relatively um, comfortable environment to have this uh, conversation fast enough because of all the latency. So, for example, if I would have separated generation from selection, it would have been much harder uh, and longer process. Uh, this model allows you to generate, like in fill, with the help of Python script, uh, the empty MIDI items right in the DAW, and that lets me right away to evaluate, is it something what I want or, or like I keep on trying. Uh, okay, so then of course there was uh, like another part when you <laughs> put everything into scores from MIDI, then you kind of try to correct the voicing and also you know, we had a consultant, a specialist in early music who was also uh, editing some things out, but we agreed that any kind of discrepancies or weirdnesses which seem to sound like an early music uh, of that time, however have something strange, <laughs> Uh, we would still keep it because then what would be the sense to you know then we could have just written it by 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 ourselves like we we still wanted to keep all this uh, thematic core so basically each measure is in one or another way of course with corrections and additions afterwards like a limited its first uh, like a thematic uh, its first thematic uh, reason for it happening uh, was actually there by like generated with the help of uh, AI, with the process I just tried to explain quickly. I can play maybe some of the excerpts uh, very shortly of, of, of the music. Mm. Whoops. Uh. Oh, now it will sound <laughs> properly, sorry. Mm. Um. Maybe another example. Uh, of course, in some cases, I just use something which was typical for the time. Like, for example, some typical sequences. If if we decided that this piece will be a passacaglia, you know, it was kind of uh, easy. You already have the bass line, and then you give some inspiration and rhythm for the melody to kind of fit the Italian text. By the way, that was the biggest problem because this model does not evaluate text itself, and it's. Uh, I kind of have an idea how it would be possible to <laughs> to train a model which takes into account both uh, rhythm of text and so on. Uh, but in the end, we we kind of did it half manually, then trying to stitch the text more or less around the rhythmic 
uh, we created. Uh, and in some cases, it also added some additional weirdness, uh, which is, you know, for you to evaluate is it okay or not. In some cases, uh, we would try to get as far away from prompts as possible. However, in at least one case, um, just for the sake of you know having this as, as a kind of a case study or example, uh, like uh, there was the result which was very close, although the prompts included some other stuff, but very close to one song of Monteverdi, Portimiro, which was in the training, of course. And then we thought, like, okay, uh, maybe that's uh, that's weird, but maybe let's leave it. <laughs> so. So those of you who know Portimiro can hear like it's like intonations is like on the in this border of it being like a plagiarism, but it's maybe not, maybe yes, you know. So it's <laughs> very weird. It, it gives a lot of uh, questions and ideas about what is style and uh, and uh, and what is actually original creation. You can see some of the uh, scores from this there. Okay, maybe I stop for now. Uh, now we can talk about staging, I guess. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, staging. Um, when we talk about this uh, staging of the of this opera, uh, a few things were unconventional and strange for me as a director. Uh, one of them really determined uh, the process, and the other, like more determined the style of the images that you see in the opera. <coughs> so first uh, problem, in many cases, lighting technicians and projections, VJs and uh, other stage technicians don't read uh, music from, from the score, from the sheet. Uh, because like uh, early opera requires a variety of voices uh, which often have to be found not only Lithuanian, but uh, also abroad. As that Italian librettist uh, did in the 17th century, we had only five days uh, on stage with the solists, so we could prepare the light design and the video projection changing points from the recording, but this opera have never been performed before. So, like, <laughs> what would... <laughs> So uh, the Sibelius recording uh, didn't seem very clear to them uh, because it's hard to identify the vocal lines. It, it doesn't have any text, so it's not possible to rehearse changes inside the scene uh, that will be linked to specific meanings of the libretto. So the basis for the technicians to work without all the solists and their orchestra waiting on the stage was only given to them after the first premiere. So after the opera has been uh, recorded, so for the next evening we were able to work from the morning without solist and orchestra and rehearse the exact uh, transitions of the lights and the projections. So after the first premiere, so con congratulations to everyone who, 
who participate our, uh, our project in the second premiere. <laughs> and, and the second strange thing is like this meta surreal uh, dualism of the historical and the contemporary um, in philosophical meaning and in, in practice. Unfortunately, like. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the soloist hadn't learned opera music by heart, so we had to come up with like a semi-concert uh, form, where uh, with the orig original costumes and projections and mise en scene, lighting design. Uh, but the soloist wouldn't have to walk around, and they could uh, do the musical numbers to their own, standing by the notes. Often. Um, when you trying to stage a classical opera, directors usually like to refer to each other or each other produ pro, uh, productions, quoting each other and creating a kind of discussion with the most famous stagings of the opera and uh, tradition. Uh, <clears throat> and it has its own tradition, its own canons of staging, and when you're choosing a stage style, you are constantly like denying, flirting, or talking with other productions. So in this case, you are in the empty field, and no interpretations uh, influences your aesthetic choice. But on the other hand, it is still a historical opera in style, and if what, if what we're trying to pretend. So you are dependent on the Baroque artistic and musical tradition of that time. So you have to like in a sense create an alternative meta history of uh, that style and uh, and then stylized it uh, here for the present time in this way the opera should refer both uh, to the fictional or fantasized historicity of the opera and to a new adapted adaptation for the present time so you have to imagine like the tradition you are quoting and style it right there. So this is why the choice was made to create the video projections also with the help uh, of the artificial intelligence mid-journey, maybe Rimas will tell more about it, uh, based on early Baroque paintings and to use historical uh, and character status details in the stylized modern costumes. And it was an interesting discussion with early opera, which was missing, and uh, an attempt to keep its historicist context when they didn't really survive, and it was never interpreted on stage. So it was like, create something in your head and then interpret it. And so <laughs> that's that the main impressions of me, mm -hmm. from me. Yeah. I just want to use the microphone. It does work, I think. Oh, so uh, what I should tell? Um, yeah, so basically, my colleague uh, uh, Gilvenas Vingales, he called me and he told. Uh, no, basically, it was Vito who, who is managing this. He, yeah, he approached me and he, so he offered me this project and. Uh, I I saw this as a an opportunity to try stable I mean uh, to create something with artificial intelligence so my choice was basically to use uh, stable diffusion as a as quite easy way to to produce images so basically I was using a automatic 11 11 extension because it's uh, yeah because it's open source and it's for free and uh, yeah. <clears throat> so what can I say? Uh, it turned out to be that the default model was the best model for generating images and most, uh, yeah, the models which were created for for generating uh, realism was uh, actually were not very useful, but like in combination I was maybe using 30% models of like hyperrealism models and like maybe 70% of this default stable diffusion model which yeah which turn, turned out to be yeah very very I don't know uh, a great way to 
generate a lot of images. So basically I was surprised that you can generate so many images in so short time and like I started doing it maybe, yeah. So basically in one month I was able to generate two hours of image which is <laughs> which is very surprising for me because usually uh, it takes forever to yeah to render, especially if you are working with higher resolution. So basically, I will talk more uh, uh, specifically, like more technically, because I am coming from this quite technical um, side. And uh, uh, what else? So basically, yeah, I was very surprised. And uh, there is this uh, also limitation, but also huge uh, how to say huge advantage but also limitation because this deform it has its own very sort of recognizable feature and also recognizable look and you cannot avoid it so it's basically sort of uh, uh, something like uh, stop motion imagery and and you cannot avoid it because basically it's diffusing like interpolating one image to another and so it's it looks always quite the same but uh, what i noticed that for the generating images for for stage it's sort of very good i i don't think current models are quite uh, advanced for the cinema as some people think but like for the stage place i was surprised that i remember back in the day i was working with uh, oscar skorshnovas and he would ask me to do for instance video projection of the, I don't know, leg, and uh, it would take for me, I don't know, days to model and then render it, and I now understood that <laughs> I can make it in one second, basically, if if director wants it. Of course, it's not that easy, because still you have to, uh, you have to select the image which is suiting you best, so it's not, still it takes a lot of time just for picking the right image you generate and also for me it was strange when we are talking about this opera that still Mantotas was saying oh we created and i thought well i was not creating i was just you know generating it and what is generating it's, it's like you are playing with the uh, uh with the not diamonds how you call it uh, Go look uh, the dice, dice. Da, yeah. So basically, yeah, you are just playing with the dice, and you have three words, prompt, and you just dice, dice. I don't know. You you just play for, I don't know. So it's a different reality. Yeah, it's very different reality, and um, but it was interesting uh, challenge, and uh, what else? Uh, also, what I noticed that, uh, for instance. Sometimes it's better to prompt not, not like um, instead of prompting uh, uh, Baroque style, it's just better to prompt, for instance, painting or whatever, because it's it's not very good at very specific things. So it's it's sort of those algorithms. It it uh, the machine likes abstract sort of things, and so. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, uh, there is there there is this limitation because you are always prompting something. You are prompting like uh, the painting of the nine, uh, okay, 17th century painting of the Andromeda or whatever, and so uh, it's very strange that if you want high quality visual, it needs a lot of sort of story, a lot of narrative. And if you just giving the words of atmosphere, it's usually giving you back results, which was for me a surprise. Uh, because usually when I think of visuals, I'm not thinking like a super long narrative that somebody, I don't know, running, going somewhere and appearing, disappearing. But for, for, for the strange reason, uh, algorithm likes this a lot of narratives when it's sort of shining and when you're just saying the atmosphere it sort of doesn't know what to do and you just see a lot of noise and artifacts most of the time because you're just saying the words i mean so what i understood that it's not that good at the atmosphere and it likes sort of stories a lot of stories short stories so they're quick and then you can make it effective but if you want like 
10 minute movement usually yeah i don't know it's it was for me also some challenge to make it but uh, so what else i think yeah i think interesting thing was this uh, sense of artifacts uh, like uh, for me at least in music and the most interesting part was this a little bit of weirdness in in uh, everything also there was some artifacts and weirdness in in the computer generated imagery which i think also was the kind of the coolest stuff yeah. there like you know seeing an angel transforming into an airplane you know <laughs> or things like that so um, yeah uh, okay so i don't know maybe we we will finish i'll just launch a little bit more of the pictures <laughs> Okay, so questions. <laughs> Thank you for a very interesting uh, project. And I was just wondering, so since this, uh, this is a kind of a, a modern take on a reinterpretation of a lost opera in a way, I was wondering, in terms of the number of musicians and the number of people uh, in the choir, um, was that a decision made on some historical accounts? Is there, or is there any uh, historical accounts of how many people was assigned to the to the court in terms of musicians, or was this uh, like uh, done um, on uh, and what was uh, available for you? maybe kind of both but they of course it's also uh, budgetary restrictions you know how many musicians you can hire like if you want to have a choir which sounds at least a little bit like a choir you need at least two people maybe per, per, per voice so that's what we had <laughs> for example i mean limitations always is the main inspiration for creativity or based on like historical accounts probably might have been bigger or smaller in some cases it also depends on what kind of budget <laughs> court had for the production of opera in those times well i mean you can see more like um, you know there is this um, I wouldn't say that this production was like uh, hip you know like historically informed performance it was it had some hip inside, <laughs> but but it also was missing quite a lot to call it uh, hip. Uh, in, in, I think that generally it would be nicer to have a bit bigger choir because there were qu quite some choral pieces. But you know, I think it was bigger actually a, a little bit in those times. But you know, you work with what you have. <laughs> Thank you, super interesting. And, and to my surprise, uh, I had some troubles hearing the contemporary part. I mean, it was really more historical than I expected from your descriptions. Uh, in my presentation, I skipped a little branch where I talked about the Uncanny Valley, which is a well-known phenomenon from robotics when they are like humans, but almost too, they, they are too super realistic, but there's just a little thing that doesn't, fit and then it becomes really awkward uh, did you have any feeling of that when you worked with this kind of music where it, i mean because it can happen often it's a question of form and timing that are weird in music uh, and that can create that feeling that oh this sounds like baroque but wait a little there's something weird there did, did that happen to you 
yes, it happened to us, I guess, and also to performers, first of all. Uh, maybe the, the one thing was that we made an artistic decision not to, like, uh, Okay, in some cases, you know, like you have uh, recitativos in early operas and if the form is bigger, it kind of makes sense. When we shortened the form, we tried to do some of the dialogues or like songs where it's hard to tell, is it recitativo or aria? So <laughs> that is exactly from Uncanny Array, I think. I mean, when we will edit and publish all the recording, you can listen and, and you will understand what I mean because it's hard to tell, like it's kind of an aria, but also it can be a recitativo, <laughs> you know. And also this this fact of that, although the music was prompted with the rhythm of the text, uh, of which survived, you know, like you read the text and think, okay, how I can put now it in three fourths or four fourths or six eighths or whatever. Uh, then still, when you put in the text, even if the accents are in more or less right place. It still kind of feels off in some cases, and we edited some of these things out, but some of it we left, and I think especially for performance, it was like like weird, you know, like usually it doesn't happen. I mean, it can be like this, but it's hard to say, <laughs> like that it feels very natural. Uh, so it, there was a bit of, of, of this, also some harmonies and, and like, uh, According maybe to the, the how the Baroque progression happens, yes, it is like more or less like that. But for example, it kind of keeps on changing and fluctuating over tetrachords, which doesn't necessarily happen all the time, and so on. But again, that was maybe it was quite subtle for the listeners, or you know, for those people who really know that stylistics. Uh, you know, it was a bit weird. It should have been. <laughs> So that's it. Yes, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I can't see in front of light. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, super interesting. And I really appreciate to see some images because they couldn't enjoy the performance. My question is related about your, your experience and, and how do you see experiences like this for for uh, as a tool for the creation of new audiences so do you think that experiences like that connect with the new audiences can you generate can you attract uh, uh, millennials centennials alpha generations in opera uh, using artificial intelligence using using visuals that has happened in 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 electronic music festivals so what's your point about that Uh, actually, like, like uh, you said that uh, you thought that it would be more contemporary and we have one review that it's uh, not historical at, at all. So we are somewhere in, in the fringes uh, and no one accept us um, from the professional side. But uh, the strange thing that from the public relationships or audience actually i felt like maybe we should ask vito as our producer but i felt like we invited very diverse crowd one of them come here to see historical opera that they liked other of like uh, young generation to see what's happening with this artificial intelligent thing in opera it's strange and uh, this um, because we had these two shows and it was uh, sold out maybe three weeks before the PM year or month. So uh, I think from that uh, uh, PR pers perspective, it works and it sells. But uh, actually the other problem, how professionals uh, want to accept it and uh, uh, why sometimes we create these cages for each other and then we are angry that someone is getting out of the cage. <laughs> I would add that um, in one of my previous presentations mentioned that uh, what is always important for me is the impact of everything of what I do and I try to think about it. I I never uh, like can foresee it because it's normal. We can't foresee everything <laughs> no matter what kind of well-developed model we have in our head. Uh, however, for me, it was also important in this case uh, to show that our, our sphere, also like a classical music, let's say, sphere with all its uh, fringes and ecosystem, 
It's also something which keeps on working uh, with, um, you know, with, with stuff which is like a buzzword now, you know, like AI, for example, right? I mean, we, we work in AI uh, in experimental electronics already for 20 or 30 years, but usually the style of music we create does not necessarily reach the wide amount of people. And they think that, ah, you know, musicians are somebody, you know, like <laughs> very much in 15th or 16th century. So it was also like a marketing project in a way or a audience development project as well. I think another very important symbolic value for me was to also like communicate to people in the country and out of the country that you know the opera history in Lithuania started not necessarily at the beginning of 20th century when some of the national operas were composed however you know 300 years ago which is kind of nice okay so just a question to all of you in so since there is uh, the whole research field uh, also um, for doing reconstructing of, of dead or endangered languages, now that you are sort of been doing this for lost operas, have you got any um, interest from other cities or other places for reviving uh, lost operas? And or do you want to want to work more with this kind of approach? Yeah, we, we talked with Pantotas about that we really want to like uh, change this perspective to this work because we don't really try to recreate uh, something or like Mantota said, it's one of the parallel universe and like for me like and for an, an, an artist it's really interesting to go to this uh, Pa parallel universes of uh, historical things and uh, because I don't really like this very very just contemporary uh, thing I'm really into this uh, um, historical art but uh, you need to uh, all good artists trying to like have discussion with these uh, centuries uh, old centuries and this art and now you can have this discussion in uh, this meta level where you talk with someone that do not exist anymore but you want to not recreate but create something that you can have the conversation with so it's uh, a lot of loneliness but really interesting <laughs> it's basically it's very interesting way of experiencing the relationship with the tradition and with the heritage uh, which is always there, actually. I mean, even the music we create nowadays is very much influenced what, I don't know, Monteverdi did in the 17th century, even we we do noise electronics. Uh, in this case, it's more direct, but it's also a way of thinking and learning about yourself and music. And art, visuals, I don't know. Would you agree to <laughs> do more of <laughs> projections like this? <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, I was thinking that, you know, you were sort of recreating opera and me, I sort of, I don't think there, there were at the time video projections, so I was, <laughs> so it's for me this question is... But you know, you yeah, can see that I, your work is like, uh, they had tapestries, so... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's for me clear that I was just creating from scratch and it had nothing to do but it had to do with the atmosphere and uh, the time so yeah of course it's interesting okay maybe because we have to move on to the next part thank you very much colleagues thank you for listening um, unfortunately anna ablamonova got sick uh, who it's it's very sad that we um, we, we don't have her today with us to give a presentation and participate in a discussion. Maybe let's have like, a, because the discussion should start like in six minutes, let's have a short break and then, then, then we can advance to it. So we'll get back in five, six minutes.
Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. So this is the last session of today here at, at the Vilnius Art Fair. Well, and this is my privilege to, to be invited to moderate this session, this conversation about the future of opera. Well, it's a challenging title, so I like it. And well, this is my privilege to to start to start this conversation that stands at the intersection of tradition and innovation because uh, we had a previous session about artificial intelligence applied in in opera. So today we are privileged to have with us distinguished group of experts who are shaping the opera world in unique and dynamic ways. So the first person I want to introduce is Audrius. Kunt Rotas, the general director of the Lithuanian National Opera and Ballet Theater. Hello. I'm adapting the titles to the English, so I try to do my best. Jonas Sakalauskas, singer, entrepreneur, CEO, Lithuanian exhibition at Congress Center, Lit Expo. Thank Hello, you. thank you. Thank you so much. And last but not least, Jurate Katinait, musicologist, member of the Lithuanian Council of Culture. Thank you. Thank you for joining in this conversation. So our, our panelists are the driving forces behind the scenes, on the stage, and at the crossroads where tradition meets transformation. They will approach our discussion from different angles, offering a variety of perspectives and visions. And to kickstart the discussion, I'll propose some thought-provoking questions, but only as a starting point to navigate and initiate an engaging conversation. Okay, that's the idea. But, well, I have a personal obsession. This is not the first time I will ask about that because uh, I moderated other panels in, in Spain, and, and, and this is one of the things that uh, I'm so interested in. And it's that discussion about tradition versus modernity. So opera has a rich history, but how do you see it evolving in the digital age? And what innovations are being introduced to engage modern audiences and make the art form more accessible? I'm introducing many things, so digital, the, the digital age, digital platforms, but also engagement, how to engage the new audiences and make opera more accessible and more attractive. Who wants to start with, with the questions? Do you want to start? <coughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that I will s say in a s maybe sad note, maybe not sad note, but uh, of the point of, of view in innovation, because uh, sometimes I think that uh, we can attract our audience just doing traditional opera. You know, it's and it's uh, I can say by my uh, uh, in, in 20 years of my being in opera world, let's say uh, I can say that biggest audience is in a traditional audience, and 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 it's it's. It's then opera try to to be more uh, have more innovation. Not every time it uh, uh, it brings more audience. So you know, and uh, and it's yeah this discussion in 2018 in a Madrid. I was in a World Opera Forum. There were all opera companies. Yeah, there were Opera America, Opera South America, Opera Europe, uh, Opera Asia, you know, and they discuss about why now, at these days, uh, we have only 10% of the names, you know, from these days, and 90% and of the composers from the 90s, because in the 90s, in uh, the 90th century, uh, you know, 90% of all operas was, you know, contemporary operas, let's say. So we discuss about that and, you know, and nothing changed. Everyone understands that we need to change something. 
but still, uh, I think the big, uh, almost everywhere, traditional opera, it's with a simple acting, simple singing. Every time is more attractive for the for the audience, and it's really difficult to find a new audience. But you know, is a let's say it's a problematic question. It's it's maybe sad, but true. It's it's like like that. Thank you. Maybe I could add, you know, what Jonas said. In my opinion, usually I'm really not optimistic, so in this case I'm the same optimistic, you know. If uh, to talk about what Jonas mentioned, that's right, you know, probably our classical operas attracts more audience, but in any case, we need probably to look from another perspective. Every director who, you know, creates a stage the opera at this moment, we search a new forms, you know, in this case, we attract, you know, and new technologies. If you mentioned about, you know, some technological progress, I, I mean, you know, innovation pro progress, we're searching how, you know, the all classical operas to make, you know, just to look like indifferent already in perspective, you know. And that's probably one of the ways, you know, just looking forward. But from other side, you know, it's really difficult to evaluate everything at this moment because, you know, what create now, maybe after 100 or 200 years, it's going to be total classical music. And, you know, the audience after 200 years will say, you know, just listen, you know, in 21st century, they, they created old mania. So it's difficult, as I said, you know, just to be a, a judge, you know, uh, that to say, you know, what at this moment we're creating, like contemporary music, it's unpopular. Maybe yes, but from other side, you know, we need to look, because you mentioned before about the audience, I mean that we need to know just to work probably harder with our, you know, just audience to start from young age, that, you know, to educate them, that this, you know, young people, you know, who will be, you know, just one day probably, you know, politicians, uh, whatever, high offic of officials, whatever, you know, they would come to the theatre because if they will, ha they will have no this experience, you know, in their young days, if num uh, somebody not, you know, just attract, you know, to the opera, they will, will never ever appear in opera. So in my point of view, you know, I, will, I would say, you know, just we're on the right track, on the right track. Um, I'm talking about in this case, case maybe about Lithuania, seeing, you know, our audience pretty young, if compared with, you know, West Europe, let's say, you know. So I believe that, you know, just what we're doing at this moment, you know, so we'll have good, you know, just and positive, you know, implications in our future. Jurete, do you want to add anything mm -hmm. else? Yes, I agree that it's uh, really not the best time for the opera business, uh, for classical opera, for, for the traditional repertoire. But uh, there is uh, one thing I would like to underline, that um, opera um, has a special vivid uh, gene, because it's the only genre in the music history that was created artificially. Because all the genres were born because um, of uh, particular socio-cultural circumstances. And opera was not, because uh, a few inte uh, intellectuals in Florence, Flore, Flore uh, Camerata Fiorentina, some intellectuals gathered and decided that they uh, would restore the antique Greek uh, tragedy. So uh, the result was absolutely different, <laughs> not the Greek tragedy, but the opera. So, and uh, this genre already vivid for uh, four centuries. So this is the oldest genre in the music history. If we don't talk about uh, church music, of course, about mass, but uh, in any cases, all of the genres already died that was produced some centuries, five or six centuries uh, before, and madrigals and uh, motets, uh, they are not so vivid, but opera is still vivid. So I think that um, this um, art and this business is always uh, moved by very talented people, and we never know who who will be the new Gluck or the new Mozart or the new Metastasio who will say that now we need the new things in the opera genre. Yeah, and, and you know what's this not strange but interesting thing and what we need to, to uh, 
remind in in in, in Florence at that time, as uh, as uh, uh, Jurat mentioned, it was uh, opera was absolutely new innovation at that time. So still, you know, uh, opera is uh, it's yes sometimes like it's traditional bel canto or something like that but on the other hand it was like a uh, new genre of innovation so innovation it's it's uh, it was you know in the roots of the genre uh, scenography you know uh, dress uh, music uh, it was at that time something very extra extra thing so so maybe we wait for the new gluck maybe we wait for new new composers but, but i think that it's not uh, not now but maybe in the future it will come and we will come come back to the roots and our roots it's uh, innovation and something new something extra okay uh, let me dip a little bit in your in your answers because uh, you talk about uh, w well, we are in a contemporary art fair, and we are talking about the future of opera. And you, for example, Jonas, introduce the difficulties of connecting with contemporary people. So this is a discussion I had also with contemporary artists in Barcelona. So how is possible that contemporary artists have all this difficulty for connecting with contemporary people? Because um, it it seems that that they 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 must be closer. So um, what's the difficulty for connecting? And also, for example, also connecting with with Adrius, you 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 ask why uh, contemporary music isn't popular. So, and I was thinking it doesn't happen in other genres. So in, in music, so there's a big connection from some specific genres with, with the audience. So uh, I, I want to dip a, a little bit more here, but um, you talk about innovations. So what can we do? How can we engage for connecting with these modern audiences, with these new audiences? So millennials, centennials, the, the, the youngest, the alphas, so what can we do for connecting with them? Oh, okay. I have a very short remark um, about it, uh, because if we talk that opera is an art, art form, so we have a little bit different problem. But if we can say uh, that opera is pop art, it's also a way a way out because uh, in 18th century or even in in the 19th century we had opera as a pop art for popular for 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 the folk <laughs> for the pop pops and uh, for the wide audience uh, but uh, nowadays we understand opera as a serious art and uh, this is a gap between pop art and um, serious art because uh, pop artists and pop music is dedicated to um, to entertain people, and to really you can gather a lot of people to listen to very good pop music. But uh, if you have um, serious art or serious music, it's not about entertainment. It's about uh, uh, traumatic questions of a human being. It's not so. Mm, easy and uh, we as uh, as a human being we try to avoid all these terrible questions because we would like to to survive and not to think a lot but uh, uh, art and visual arts and music and serious music it's always um, it's, it, they always um, uh, returned us to this question why we why we're here what, what what will be next? What will be after after our life? What will be then? So these uh, terrible questions and terrible uh, questions that arises in society, this is topics for serious art. And uh, and uh, I don't know if we 
only stress to the um, audience and to entertain it, uh, we will lose this very uh, serious and very important uh, question that uh, art is about uh, questions, about serious questions in our life. Yeah, but we need to deal with you know, what is the opera because you know in, in, in contemporary opera there are maybe minimal free ways uh, which type of the operas we have and sometimes it's maybe they don't have something nothing uh, uh, similar things to, to another so we need to understand that there were you know big operas contemporary let's say mainstream operas, there are chamber, contemporary operas, you know, let's say near the big operas, but a little bit smaller form. And th there is alternative operas, which is uh, more like post-drama, like contemporary dance or something. What is after the something, after the genre? And, uh, and everything is called, uh, let's say, contemporary opera stage. And for that, it's really difficult to, to understand how we can educate our audience. Mm -hmm. What is the opera? Uh, because one one uh, one time is uh, you know it's even no opera singers. Sometimes no singers. Sometimes only speaking voice. Sometimes not every time music and and, and it's more, maybe more sound design. And uh, another time, you know, even the glass or, or, or another composer writes, you know, in a, in a minimal technique, but it's still, it's a big operas, big, big, big choirs with, with, the, uh, with this line, you know, dramatic line. Uh, and uh, and every, everything we speak like that it's contemporary opera. So one thing is really important to, to understand what we, about what we're speaking, you know, <laughs> about which opera because one time you know we need to to attract our our audience and uh, and try to catch a traditional opera things you know bel canto singing uh, symphonic sound and so on and so on another time you know we need to to uh, educate people to understand contemporary art because contemporary op alternative contemporary opera is maybe more near with the visual art, with the performance, but not with the opera. So yeah, it's a tricky question, and every time we discuss about so where we are, <laughs> and and what we want to do with this, or it is opera, or maybe we can call it an opera because it's really different stages. Yeah, it's interesting because you've introduced the word education uh, for for different times. So, uh, hear me, Casey Notrius, is what can we do? Because uh, we live in a rapidly changing demographics, uh, uh, cultural preferences, so many things happen at the same time. So, how can opera remain relevant and resonate with diverse audiences? And how ca can we educate these new generations in opera? And if you want to add any any personal approach or any experience, so it's welcome. Thank you. It's really, really good questions. Thank you, by the way, really for asking this, because I'm constantly thinking about this thing. And you know, just to return a bit back, you know, just about contemporary, contemporary music, I want to say. Uh, it's not a stigma, contemporary music. We say that it's not 100% contemporary music, you know, it's really hard to listen and it's difficult to attract uh, some young people. From one side, yes, from the other side, you know, I could discuss about it, but probably no, a lot. So we don't have so lot of time. But I mean, you know, in this really uh, pretty fast moving world, we that's avoidable. We need to accept all this progress, that's right. We need to accept innovation, we need to accept technology. And if to look, you know, from perspective of young people, what I want to say, recently we had like in Lithuania, um, Grand Duke uh, Palace uh, by AI created opera. That's attracted, that's pro opera by the way, but that's attracted a lot of young people. That's what I want to say. In this case, if the young people, you know, young audience comes to listen all this kind of 
music. So that's we, on the right you know just way and the right path because later that's well already educating. So we're not afraid to know just to, to the new venues. We're not afraid to come to opera. We're not afraid, uh, afraid to hear something new. So in this case, you know, with this education, like you know, just in contemporary art, whatever, it's helpful, you know, create kind of uh, to be more cultural, let's say, you know, just in society. And in my opinion, that uh, as I said, you no know, time of course will show you now in these living days, you know, what's popular or not, you know, probably after one hundred years. I mean this contemporary composers who created this moment music and nobody maybe not comes, you know, to, to the concert, but maybe after one hundred years gonna be pure classical, you know, performances. So and uh, we're working a lot really hard, you know, to attracting attract young people. And by the way, I need to say about some niche opportunities, what I want to say. Uh, we've got like an uh, experimental project in opera uh, that's uh, where experimental opera we attracts a lot of some new technological things. Like, like somebody talks on the phone, we're recording and already using in, in this opera kind of uh, performance, let's say. So comes, come, it comes new things in opera which never ever been before. So I mean with this you no know, progress, uh, maybe plus you know, with digital progress, I mean because young people, you know, may watch you know, some famous areas or whatever contemporary new composers on, on TV or computer screen. So that helps for them in this case, you know, just to realize probably that opera, it's not old fashioned things at all. That's my opinion, you know. And a lot of, you know, on, the, on TV, by the way, I'm a big fan of BBC News, you know, that's, you know, there are some like uh, topics, you know, take me to the opera. So I'm a big fan of this, you know, just kind of, of this program, so it's it shows that you know that opera is still a matter, and it's real you know just people you know just uh, involved in, in opera, people are curious about opera. So I think it's gonna be, in any case, in my opinion, the future for the opera is really bright. Do you want to add any? Uh, I want any to come back to the innovation. You know, some, sometimes I. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to be skeptical, you know, about innovation, but when you speak about stage art, there, 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 there is this innovation. There is this innovation. Yes, we can use that 3D mapping. We can use some, you know, lamps. We can use, you know, scenography. We can use uh, uh, some machinery and new things. Yes, but, but you know, but that's it. It's, it's. It's nothing interesting. It's you know all, already exists, you know, and I think that digital digitization and new uh, things. It's important to to put in a in a network, you know, with the audience. We need to work more with the social network, with the apps, with the game industry, and so I think these links and these networks will create new bridges, and it's more important than 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 try to find new innovation in opera, because almost all innovation we had in opera, we had big operas, traditional operas uh, at these days, New composers write this, you know, with the, with the arias, with the, with the choirs. Some of them write in a minimal uh, style. Some of them write in a uh, uh, expressionism uh, uh, style. Some of them write in a uh, another style, in a let's say semi-musical, semi-opera style. Some of them made a, uh, create in a. Uh, neoclassic style, you know, they use a lot of styles, and in same way there are uh, mono operas, small operas with, uh, with 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 the computers, with some innovations, and in, with dance. For example, I made some operas, dance operas, with the uh, video, the, the contemporary dance and singing. So there are a lot of a lot of, you know. In, in different forms at that time, so with a lot of innovations. So, but it not helps to to find a new stream of the new opera and to, to which help for us to find new audience. And so, I'm not skeptical. I think that everything is working. There are small stage for the contemporary opera. There are some place in a in in our big theaters contemporary. Uh, 
uh, traditional opera, uh, but still we it's it's not interesting streams, it's not big streams. Yes, and we try to find our messias in 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 opera, and I hope we will. But it's not about you know 3D mapping and uh, I don't know. Because it's stage art, you know, it's, yeah, they use some innovation and sometimes they can, I think that we need to think more about sustainability, we need to think about more with, connect uh, contemporary opera or opera tradition with, uh, so, uh, with uh, different social groups. So I think this these links is more important at that moment, and this is innovation. I think real innovation than the classical culture, academical culture, uh, uh, create the bridges. Because you know, in in this in this time, there there are a lot of wars. Then the people lives in the bubbles. We need to spread these bubbles. We need to try to to connect them. And sometimes it's a simple things. Sometimes we need to think about another people who maybe not understand because sometimes it seems for the for me that maybe some composers or some producers think that yeah we do contemporary opera and 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 people need to listen to this but but if we not prepare and not create this link it seems like listen uh, uh you know uh, uh audio uh book you know, in a Ch in a Chinese language, you know, and and we just listening Roman, you know, it it not makes sense. So so I think that innovation is a new links, a new bridges, and it's every time it's important attract our audience and connect, you know, not special to the opera, but to, to connect to the. Uh, to the uh, communication about opera, connect to the education, connect to the create a, uh, different interdisciplinary projects near the opera. So I think this is a way. May I add yes, a please. little bit? No. Um, I think about modern uh, contemporary opera. I'm just thinking as well about you know, how the states you know, should be involved in this process because if you talk about you know, just cultural normal society, I mean, you know, just educational culture is very important you know, in this case. In any case, you know, just I need to give answer, a question for myself, you know, how many you know, just new contemporary order I ordered it you know, to create for composers. I mean that all of us who work in these cultural fields need to be responsible as well because if we you know, just order to create for composers this new contemporary music, new opera. So it means that you know, we're inspiring, you know, that's to create, you know, and it's gonna be appear if we will stop, you know, in this process. I mean, you know, just what we've got, you know, classical opera, that's enough. So we're not very interesting in, you know, in ordering new, comp you know, com compositions, whatever, or new contemporary opera. So it might be, you know, just we will stuck in this, you know, positions. And that's probably wrong, you know. So we need to do probably ourselves much more that all these things appear, I mean, the contemporary operas would appear on the stage. Yeah, let me take your, your last comment. So it's interesting because you open the can of worms with the innovation. And we're, we've been talking about innovation these days. And yeah, my feeling is that innovation, according to, to, to my view, is innovation is invention plus commercialization. So an innovation from an open innovation perspective is focused on the commercialization strategy because it means impacting in your potential audience, in your potential users. And I have the feeling that most of the times, uh, most of these new proposals are focused or often leads to experimentation. The experiment, we are in the first stage of innovation. It's invention. But we need to improve and we to to rethink these strategies to connect with our audience that's a little bit my my feeling also you introduce some ideas uh Jonas, especially you when you talk about video games other sectors so this idea of cross innovation cross industry innovation cross industry partnerships it is also very interesting because Finally, the idea is connecting also with the audience. So how is the audience? So do you have the feeling that, that we need to, to, to 
Well, we can think, we can use models, we can do benchmarking and learning from experiences from other sectors. Do you think that maybe in the upper field, we need to do, to, we need to make an effort for understanding better our potential audience in order to attract them? And, and, and if you think so, I, I suppose that the answer is yes. How do you think, how, what do you propose for connecting with them? First of all, I, I think that we need to care about our audience. I think that we we care about us. <laughs> usually, we care. Okay, I'm, I'm maybe my colleagues not disagree, but we we I see that we care about us, about our culture, about how to protect our culture, how to have b bigger fundraising for that, and how to to try to bring in audience, you know, but sometimes we don't want to uh, go to this, uh, we want to go, uh, we don't want to go out, you know, from the theaters and from our rooms, then we create something to the people, you know, to the different people, because there are a lot of bubbles, you know, and, and a lot of social, let's say, groups, you know, and they have uh, d different perspective they have and we need to f try to find actual things for me and for this let's say bubble and these connections can uh, show for us the way usually we we don't want to to, uh, to do that it's not not every time happening we want to do what we want, just create a, a better advertisement, uh, have education that people understand what I want, but but I don't. I maybe I'm not sure that I want to understand the, my audience. So maybe it's uh, not every time 100 percent, but still, we live in the castles, bluebird castles. <laughs> And sometimes don't want to go out because it's difficult. It's difficult because sometimes people is angry. Sometimes they are, uh, they they are maybe for us maybe things to pop for us to to like pop culture, or maybe this uh, uh, this things actual for them. It's not actual for us. So, but every time it's not about comfort zone. So our innovation is real. It's for real to go to from this castle to the people, to the audience, uh, have some influence and come back and try to manage. I, you know, in a, in a, uh, uh, sometimes I found more uh, interesting things, not in a culture and not in the art, but maybe in a contemporary, not contemporary, but new, new business forms. And uh, when we create the apps or when we create uh, uh, games uh, and when we create something new, something innovations, and in this, uh, for example, they use agile techniques, a simple technique, but it means that we every time had a connection in a all all uh, all you know steps we have the connection with the customers, and it's really important. Then we have idea when we develop develop this, when we try to create advertisement, when we staging this, and every time we have this connection, and and it means that after one years, after uh, in the end of the, our process, we have something, but connect because our value is a connection. Our uh, and, and 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 if we don't have this connection, it's yeah. I, I, yeah, maybe we have a connection with the politics who give money for us, so it's good. But, but not every time it means that it's connection with our audience. Yeah, uh, uh, Jurate, you talk about um, pop culture, popular mm. culture, that's pop mm. art. So Jonas has introduced this idea of connecting. Mm. So mm, uh, stories like... Um, uh, Romeo and Juliet that are universal. Uh, what do you think? So, is it not really connecting with the with this new audience, or um, do, do we need to update the presentation of of these librettos? Or wh what's your point on on that? 
I think that the audience is not uh, homogeneous. People are different with different expectations and uh, democracy is not about uh, mainstream but uh, about different streams. <laughs> so and um, if we talk about um, art and about opera example opera as well so we we should have different operas, different styles and uh, different attitudes. Uh, and uh, now we have, a if, if we talk about standard repertoire, everything now is in uh, the hands of opera director, uh, because we have some decades, some four decades, not more, when drama directors came to the opera theater and uh, they really did a revolution, made a revolution how to uh, produce an opera and uh, uh, what is uh, still is untouchable is uh, uh, this is a, uh, a score by composer because a score for us is still a holy cow as we can say and um, i think i have a, such a, a feeling uh, and uh, i guess uh, that uh, in nearest future opera impresarios and uh, composers would change this also because uh, now we play standard repertoire from the very beginning from the overture to the very last note but i think that uh, uh, this um, tradition from drama theater to deconstruct classical text will come to the opera stage and it it will be uh, i hope I, I so imagine that it will be new perspectives how to uh, how to perform opera and uh, from the phenomenal from um, phenomenological side uh, what is the uh, piece of art this is our opinion because uh, we uh, experts and uh, society and um, community decide that this piece is a masterpiece but this piece is not so master so uh, good and uh, uh, the generation after repeat okay it's really a masterpiece but one day uh, one generation would say oh it's maybe a masterpiece but we, we should uh, uh, to to look a little bit uh, deeper, deeper, and uh, maybe it's uh, a little bit about different things than we uh, decided uh, it uh, for centuries. Uh, so, I think that um, standard repertoire also has a lot of uh, different approaches in the future, and uh, it will never die. But maybe it will it will be revised. And uh, as for new operas and uh, new connection with audience, you never know because uh, contemporary opera mainly is um, chamber opera. Chamber opera, it means not so uh, huge audience. And uh, if you have different uh, operas, different attitudes, you have different audience, a lot of different audiences. So uh, I think that... Um, we uh, shouldn't think uh, always how to attract people, how to attract new audiences, what to do. Uh, I think that, uh, as you want to say, we should do as we want and as really interesting for us. Then <laughs> we will have a new audience. But, but that's me yes, please, just yeah. you know, to add, you know, uh, you rightly mentioned about the future opera, so probably we need to ask ourselves, you know, so about new generation who is coming, you know, how are we going to attract them, this young generation, because every time new generations demand something new. So what's going to be the, what's going to be the tools you know, to attract these people, some digital things or some whatever, we're still not inventing to you know. So at this moment, uh, from our perspective, what I see like in Opera Ballet Theatre, we've got plenty you know, just of audience, so our occupation 98%, so we can't complain at all. So at this moment, it seems everything fine. But you know, looking forward, you know, I'm, I'm not sure with new generation, maybe they will say we need something you know, more interesting, something new that would happen on the stage. So yeah, and uh, one one thing that we need to not forget it's uh, uh, 
maybe I mean that it's not important to attract, it's important to have connection, you know, so it's not the same. And another thing that one thing will never change, maybe, maybe never, but maybe I think people, interesting people, you know, it's every time it's about people, every time about our relation, about our feelings, about our understandings and it's really important we need we need to understand that uh, or it's young generation or it's not young generation they care about another they care about them feelings about them minds so so it's really really important thing that we need to need to understand another thing that's that it's really problematic now we see that uh, in all the europe uh, uh it's every every year it is less and less uh, we have uh, less and less interest to the classic music and classic opera uh, and it's not uh, and I, it's not that i say that it's now saying all opera world you know yes in lithuania and east europe you know we are growing up and now it's it's really not bad situation in traditional opera but in all europe for example in the united states of america it's every time less and less and less. So I think that after five years, after 10 years, all of us will, will think more about opera. And I totally agree with the, uh, with the Yurate. We need sometimes to recomp recompose the opera sometimes because it's, now is another timing. And maybe we need to try to see, to, to have the Donizetti or, or Verdi, and maybe we we need to open a little bit this understanding because if you do in a traditional way for three hours, I don't know, maybe it's good, but maybe not. And and if we will we will go to the drama theater way to sometimes recompose, maybe it will be a new step to the future. But you know. Now we try to protect this, and then and then comp when director try to sometimes to change and cut do some cuts and sometimes change the places, it's so, usually it's like a scandal <laughs> in the, yeah. from the music world. Yeah, it's true. We have several examples in other in other fields that adapted their formats to the to the audience. I want to introduce one more topic because the time is running out so quickly. Um, I was thinking when I was listening to you that maybe opera can be a powerful platform for addressing contemporary social and political issues because you know that with social media it's so difficult to, to, to discuss in a free way, in an objective way, but maybe opera is a fantastic platform for, for, for that. So in that case, so how can the art form be used to create a dialogue about the challenges and opportunities of our time. Because when, at the beginning of the conversation, I, say, uh, I said, how is possible that contemporary art doesn't interest contemporary people? So uh, what do you suggest for creating this dialogue between this proposal to the people? I also, uh, one more idea. So in, in cultural management, I come from cultural management, we talk about continent versus content. How do you say that? So is it a barrier for for new people, for attracting new audience? Or, or do, do, do we need to explore uh, uh, mm, mm, other alternative spaces mm, that could be a, a, a pre-step before achieving a, a, a national opera, for example? Or how do you see that? I am not so optimistic about opera as a social, so strongly uh, socially affected art as it was in the 19th century when opera was uh, an equivalent of state. If you are um, nation, if you would like to restore your national independence, you should have an opera theater as a, such, a, such a flag. But um, I think that uh, where is the uh, 
a chance for opera to survive, it's not the realism, because we had a lot of periods in opera history when people wanted to see uh, very realistic things on stage. And uh, nowadays we also have some people who come to a theater to, to see a life. To, to see really life and uh, feelings, what we feel and so on. But uh, I think that opera is more about uh, spectacle. Because if you want to see real life, you come to the uh, drama theater and it's more realistic because people talk <laughs> in the, on stage and uh, at the opera house people sing. So it's, it's not normal because we now, now are not singing <laughs> here, <laughs> we discuss. So um, I think that uh, singing and uh, all these uh, visual um, effects, uh, it's about a spectacle that we really, really need. And uh, uh, this is our other side of human being, that uh, we are still a little bit uh, childish. And uh, uh, this, uh, these things uh, that uh, you never know what will happen on stage, it's also a challenge and it's also very attractive. Yeah, but I was thinking when you say that, that, well, people go to the West End in London or Broadway in New York, and musical are, are very success, so... Mm, not every musical success, yeah. Not, of course, but, well, most of them, so... But people travel to London or, or New York for attending musicals. I don't know, but they... But, but it's only London, maybe a little bit Madrid, a little bit Berlin, and it's uh, New York, maybe Chicago, but it's not everywhere. In Lithuania, we have, don't have the musical, real musical theater, and it's not so popular. So, you know, it's, it's, every time it's a tricky to understand whether it's a really actual and where the, there is an audience. And uh, I'm a little bit not, not disagree with the Urata about that drama theater, because I think the mus music and singing, it's more, na uh, it's not natural thing, but it's near us. Because I think that, first of all, it's not mental world. First of all, it's a feeling world. And yes, maybe I'm old school, you know, maybe I'm really uh, not modern, but still I think that, or we do, or we do, or our work is creativity, and we work in a cre cre creating, uh, in a creativity industry, or we work in a just managing. Every time is the same. We, we work with the feelings. We work with uh, with uh, our self theater and and social theater. Every and it's more theater than than in opera and in drama, and in this theater is just emotions and construction of this emotion, and uh, and and it's nothing more. And I think that it's there is a problem that we not a good friend with with our emotions, and opera. And, and music, it's its nearest instrument which speaks with our souls. So, and now then I see the post-drama theater and now in, in contemporary drama theater, you know, there are every day more and more shows without any words or then we not understand this or we they just a dance or ha acting without words. So everything is mixed and mixed. So I think I'm real optim optimistic to then I speak about opera and about then I speak about innovation, which called the drama per musica. I think that's amazing thing. Then we can sing the philosophical text when we when we sing about problems. Sometimes mm -hmm. uh, it's really a good way because we are tired from you know from the problems when we just a peak you know like that 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 something you know and it's sometimes really interesting ideas but sometimes we uh it's it's sometimes it's not interesting you know and i remember last year i tried to i did one one less lesson about managing and i tried to sing some theories of 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 uh, managing, you know, and it, you know, it's immediately sounds, you know, in another way. <laughs> Still, it's the same, 
the same text, but it sounds in another way, and it's and it's go with another direction, and it it works. So opera works, but yeah, but we need to find our way. Okay, so Audrey's. Uh now, now it's your time, and yeah, I, I, I will ask you very shortly. No, after Rodriguez, I will ask you for yeah, because last words about how do you see this future in in an optimistic way, please. <laughs> yeah. Something positive for the future. Uh, and I do remember your question was about you know uh, what the steps you know should be done you know to attract you know all these people to contemporary music. Um, in my opinion, all the steps you know just useful whatever if that you know, attracts young all the people uh, to the uh, opera or to the another you know just performances that fine you know if that works you know but you know from one side what you said you know that's right opera maybe not you know reflecting the the real life like it was in 19th century 20th century but what i've got impression from audience i see you know sometimes people in this you know pretty so moving fast wall with a lot of tensions a lot of terror whatever they need to see something uh, more beautiful something you know just not connecting with all this you know rudeness in, in, in the world, so they come like to the theatre, like to opera or ballet, you know, and they think in this beauty, because it's so nice, because they kind of escape from this reality. So it's kind of, I would say, psychological te therapy even, you know, really, because you in this for two, three hours, just gone to another kind of dimension, not being in this, you know, just this world, where a lot of awful things goes on, and you suddenly appear in another so nice world. Yeah, I like that. So music as a therapy, so it's so important. So finally, just for finishing, I will ask you for some final words, talking about this future, your vision about this future, what we must do for improving the future of opera and creating a, 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 an optimistic future for this, this wonderful discipline. I just can repeat that um, everything uh, is in the hand of uh, the creative people, of very talented people who uh, will um, tell us new ideas and we will adopt it or not. It, it depends, of course. But um, opera, uh, from its uh, origin, from its beginning, it's very innovative and uh, very technological and in the uh, Baroque uh, era we had uh, such a strong machinery on stage uh, and uh, later on and then um, instruments, music instruments also were developed up to contemporary instruments and uh, uh, up to computer music. So. Uh, so I think that uh, artificial intelligence is not a challenge for creative people, for composers. It's just a tool, a mean. And um, I think that everything will be okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jonas. <clears throat> there, there are two things. Uh, opera is have two meanings for me. One meaning is... Uh, drama per music tradition and bel canto tradition uh, post bel canto tradition and and I've, i i think that there are a lot of possibilities to to work with this field with alternative opera with, with uh, mainstream operas and there are uh, there there is a lot of possibilities another thing is a, a concept of opera genre it's it's uh, then you connect really different things. It means that, let's say, business, social thing, and and uh, visual art, and or uh, f you can use um, uh, engineering, uh, eco ecology, ec ecological things, and and something. So, opera is for me. It's every time to to f it's it's approach how to connect really difficult different things in one and and create value so so for in this way i see that there are a lot of possibilities and and opera opera concept can 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 give for us a lot of things but main accent it's it's uh, uh, 
good managing, it's every time really important for create a good ecosystem. Ecosystem for education, for the creators, for the audience, for the for a network connection. I think what is very, not bad, but it's not best thing in opera world, it's real, uh, for example, when I uh, speak with the people from the game industry, from the business markets, from the advertisement, from the, you know, uh, you know, they are really open-minded. They are fast, they adapt quick, they try to cash, catch and sometimes it's, it's, it's interesting contemporary things sometimes it's traditional things sometimes it's really pop things it's not a you know it's not problem it's main thing is to manage faster to be forward and now we uh, members of opera world we are a little not forward like we were, you know, in 19th century, we are a little bit in the back. It's, we like a classical business, and like a like oil business, like a, I don't know, maybe transport business, and it's not not interesting business, you know. So, I think that if we will change approach of our managing, it will create a new bridges, and it will create new ecosystem for the creators, audience, education, and so on and so on. Okay, you've put um, the focus on the value, How, and this value, obviously, the value depends on the audience, and this is a subjective perspective, so we must understand them. Okay, so finally, Odrius, it's your time for talking about the, the future of, okay. of As the I opera. start in the beginning, I will finish you know, the same optimistic note, just note, in any case, in my opinion, I see opera of, you know, bright future. Maybe I didn't touch, you know, but Jonas mentioned the system because a lot of, uh, like in, in Spain, I've seen two years ago, in Barcelona, it was some community involved, you know, in creating and participating in opera. And it was even provided the, the big, you know, stage for them. So, I mean, you know, it's really good, you know, just steps, you know, to attract more and involve more people, you know, society, community in this opera kind of business, let's say. So, I'm 100% sure that, of course, opera will not stand in the same positions. It's going to be some evolution in progress, that's for sure, you know. But how, you know, will, will go to, you know, to which side and how it's going to be different shapes, probably nobody will answer at this moment. But for sure that, you know, people will, will, will attend and will like it opera. That's my opinion. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much. I don't know if there's somebody who wants to, to ask anything, but it's time to finish. So uh, the idea was igniting and spirited conversation on the future of opera. This is what we try to do here. We introduced at the beginning this idea of tradition versus modernity, innovation. So maybe finally we need to create this harmonious plan because we need tradition, but we obviously need to innovate. And well, we look forward to uncovering new insights, fresh perspectives, and a shared passion for this remarkable art form. Let the dialogue begin. I hope that you continue with these discussions about how must be the future of opera, because it's important to, to, to have these forums and conversations. And thank you so much for your, for your words, your expertise, and your knowledge. Thank you, Jurate. Thank you, Jonas. And thank you, Audrey. Thank you. Thank you so much.